in the kitchen. So many recipes to share. So many cooks in the kitchen with meals for you to prepare. We've got fruits and grains, veggies and beans, more healthy food than you've ever seen. So many cooks in the kitchen, plant-based foods to prepare. So many cooks in the kitchen with ideas we're happy to share. Welcome, everybody. My name is Dilla Barman. I'm uh, in Durham, North Carolina, and I'm one of the cooks in the kitchen, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our show today. So many seasonings. What do seasonings mean to you? To me, seasoning is something which adds to the base dish. If you look at you're making a dish out of vegetables, potatoes, grains, uh, legumes, and it comes out well, but often it needs a little extra something. That's what I call a seasoning. A seasoning adds flavor to your dish. Um, sometimes the seasonings can complement a dish, but one thing I like to do in my kitchen is I like to use seasonings that are kind of different. So for example, uh, you see here, I have a, a number of seasonings. I have some citrus. So um, I'm a citrus fiend. I love citrus. At the co-op I shop at, they know when I'm coming and the first thing sometimes they say to me is, hey, such and such citrus is on sale. So a little bit of citrus juice really brings out flavor, so that can be a seasoning. Today we'll be talking about a variety of seasonings and in particular, we'll be talking about spices as well as other seasonings. Spices come from plants, they come from parts of plants. So in general, if you look at herbs, for example, I love rosemary. These are the needles of rosemary. And uh, we used to have this wonderful, huge rosemary bush, which died. So now I, I buy rosemary. I used to have so much rosemary. <clears throat> so herbs are the, the leaves of plants. Oregano is another example, basil. So here's some dried oregano. Uh, basically, if it's a leaf of a plant, often it's called an herb, H-E-R-B. Otherwise, if it comes from other parts of the plant, for example, the root, bark, or seed, then it's just a generic spice. Um, so what I'm going to be preparing today is I'm going to be making something with jerk seasoning. I love jerk seasoning. It's easy to make. Jerk seasoning is a, a set of spices that come from the Caribbean. Um, so I like, there's a local brand, it's called Pluto's. They're in Carborough, North Carolina. And I just love their seasonings. They're not very expensive and it's easy. And jerk seasonings are readily available. So you can buy it. You can make your own jerk seasoning basically. And in the recipe document, we have the recipe. It basically has some garlic powder. Uh, it has some cayenne and you can vary that cayenne. If you uh, have uh, finicky eaters who don't like it really hot, don't put much cayenne, allspice, thyme and ginger. And go ahead and throw some specialty herbs in and spices that uh, make it special to your kitchen. Um, so we'll be using some jerk seasoning. Also, we're gonna be using something called nutritional yeast, which may be new to you. So nutritional yeast is, uh, you want the fortified nutritional yeast and if you get the fortified one, it, it's uh, high in vitamin Bs, or various vitamin Bs, and it has a nice flavor. We're vegan, our whole show is plant-based, so we don't eat cheese from cows, but those who do sometimes say this has a cheesy flavor. So if you um, make a dish and you sprinkle some nutritional yeast on top, it adds a nice flavor. It's great for sauces. And one thing you can do with nutritional yeast is you can blend it with some, just a little bit of cashew. You need a little bit of cashew and some roasted red bell pepper for color, some garlic powder, and a little bit of water. Uh, and that's it, you blend it and you get kind of a cheesy sauce, which great, goes great with vegetables. Um, there's all sorts of other kinds of seasonings that I love to use. I like hot sauces and lately or the last year or so, I've really come to like this one particular brand, Yellowbird, there's many other brands. Um, but the thing I like about this is it comes in a bottle that I can squeeze and I can squeeze very little or I can squeeze a lot. I like that they have different heat levels. So the Serrano I find is very low in heat. And one really good news, here's a red jalapeno, which also isn't very high in heat. So I, I have a low heat tolerance. And so there's a pepper called the ghost pepper, which is one of the hottest peppers there is, but these guys have a ghost pepper sauce. I like it because it's organic and uh, it has a lot of organic ingredients. And uh, the ghost pepper is not the first ingredient. So mere mortals like me who can't eat lots of heat 
can enjoy the ghost pepper uh, with all these other flavors. So I still just put a few small drops, but I really enjoy that. So having a good hot sauce is a good condiment, also a good spice or seasoning. Uh, it's good to get a pepper grinder and get some peppercorns. These peppercorns are actually from India. My wife's uh, sister-in-law, uh, this is from her mom's garden in Goa, India. And so she gave us lots of peppercorns. So peppercorns, you can get colored peppercorns or black, white peppercorns. So grind it. So pepper, uh, freshly ground, has a lot of nice pungency. Uh, I also like lemon pepper, which is already ground, but it has zest in it, which is quite nice. Um, it seems to be among my other Food for Life instructors, a rage to have smoked paprika, which is new for me, based on what other people have been saying. I bought it and I like it. So it's uh, smoked paprika. It's readily available in the grocery store. Um, I love cinnamon and uh, our cook in the kitchen, Cody, has a nice uh, recipe with cinnamon and there's different kinds of cinnamon. This is the traditional Ceylon, which is an unfortunate name. That's the colonial name, Sri Lanka, Ceylon cinnamon. Uh, I also today have some Saigon or Vietnamese cinnamon. Um, so there's a variety of seasonings. What I'm going to do today is I'm, oh, and I, I have to mention this, Shoba, our cook in the kitchen, is going to go into a lot more detail, but this is a spice dibba. If you're interested in Indian cooking, I highly recommend, instead of saying, okay, this is the recipe today, so I need a teaspoon of turmeric, I need a um, um, half a teaspoon of um, cumin, I need some uh, garam masala, I need some um, mustard seeds, just go to an Indian store if you have one. They're really inexpensive, the spices, and get one of these dibbas. This dibba or box or tin is, uh, is metal. It'll last forever, and they're really inexpensive. This one costs something like $23. They're really cheap, and it comes with a little spoon. And this way, if you have a set of uh, Indian spices, and in the document I've listed what I suggest should be some good spices, then you're ready to cook many Indian dishes. So let's, let's get busy making today's dish. So I'm going to be making... Uh, a jerk seasoned tofu, so uh, air fried. So I bought some tofu. You want to get extra from tofu. And uh, if you want to be very careful, you want to put some pressure and put towel on the, to on the tofu to get rid of the water. And you'll see there's still some water. So I'm going to just drain this. Now I'm less careful with this than some others. I just do a little squeeze with my hands to get as much water out as I can. But some people, I actually have a press, but I don't use it very often. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the tofu and I'm going to slice it. So I'm going to slice it. And depending on how crispy you want it. So here's a really thin piece right here. Okay, so that's pretty thin. Let me make a thick piece. My daughter is going to be trying this in a few minutes. She has braces and she had some new braces put in. So she's a little tender. So she said, daddy, make sure you make the, the tofu relatively soft. And I've done that. So you can cut it to whatever thickness you want. I suggest it be relatively uniform. Otherwise it will cook at different levels and you'll, you might get some burning or some underdone cooking. So once you have the tofu, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my seasoning. So what I'm going to use for the seasoning is I'm going to put some nutritional yeast in. I'm going to add some sesame seeds. These are regular sesame seeds. If you can get black sesame seeds, which I do have, they don't go so well with this dish, but black sesame seeds are a good source of calcium. So I'm gonna put some sesame seeds in. I'm going to put a little bit of, um, so this is the jerk seasoning and my daughter uh, will not eat too much heat. So I'm going to go very, very light. And I knew I've already made your batch. So your batch is really little jerk seasoning, but I'm going to add some for myself. I like jerk seasoning, it has really nice flavor and it also adds some color. So I'm gonna add some jerk seasoning. Uh, I'm going to add some garlic powder. I could have taken my whole um, spice rack out, but instead I'll just grab what I need, some garlic powder. I love garlic powder. And I know the jerk seasoning has garlic powder, but I'm going to add some more. I'm gonna skip the salt because it has plenty of salt in the jerk seasoning. Um, and here's a few extra things. This is a local company that grinds its own grain. And this is called um, a three grain cereal. I like adding some grains because it adds a nice crunch. So I'm going to put just a little bit of this grain. I think it has red corn and yellow corn, and I think it might have some oats. I'm just add a little bit of that there just for color, appearance, texture. I'm also going to add some panko breadcrumbs, which are readily available in the grocery store. So that also adds some crunch. Okay, and make this your own. You can tailor it to your own tastes. And then what I'll do is I will simply 
go ahead and mix the spices up, nutritional yeast, the seasonings, and I will dredge the tofu like so. And you can see how it's nicely covered. Okay, you can see that. And so then what I would do is I would put it in the air fryer. So later on, I will, do, I will dredge the rest of these, but let me mention, my wife doesn't eat tofu, it bothers her stomach. You can still use the same techniques, but use vegetables. So here I have, for example, some asparagus, some broccoli, and some um, Brussels sprouts. Uh, so what I'll do, and by the way, here's a hint, when you buy asparagus, what I do is I rinse it immediately, so it's set to go, and then I put it in a jar with water, and I keep it vertically in the refrigerator to stay fresh. When I'm ready to use it, this is clean, it's been washed. And so what I'll do with the asparagus is I'll cut the very bottom off. So cut the very bottom off. In this case, this is pretty thick. I'm not going to discard this. I'll either compost it or this is great as stock. So when you make soup, throw this in as well as things like Brussels sprout leaves. It makes a really good stock. So I'm hanging onto this. I could have composted it too. And then notice if I take something like a vegetable, the, the seasonings don't stick very well, right? So I can kind of force them into the nooks and crannies. So what you can do is you can first put some liquid on your vegetable. So, you know, when you buy chickpeas, it has a liquid in it. You can dip it into that liquid. You can just put a teeny bit of water or citrus, or I make my own homemade soy yogurt, which has soy milk and the last culture. It's really easy to make. I can share the link of how I do it. So this is my homemade vegan yogurt. So what I can do with the yogurt is I can dip my vegetable into the yogurt first. And I can get messy and just put my hands in it too. But there goes the yogurt. And now I can dredge the, dredge the vegetable and you can see how nicely the seasoning sticks. Okay. And same thing with Brussels sprouts. With Brussels sprouts, I would cut them in quarters. So what I'm going to do is um, I've already made a batch about 20 minutes ago and they're in the air fryer. So, I'm going to ask my daughter, come. So here is the completed version. You can see I have some tofu. This tofu doesn't have jerk seasoning because of my daughter. And then I have some broccoli and I have some uh, Brussels sprouts and I have some asparagus. Asparagus cooks a little faster. If I were more mindful, I would have taken the asparagus out a little bit earlier. So let me introduce to you Anu, who's going to bring a plate. And grab the spatula, sweetie, too, please. Thank you. So Anu is uh, a cook in the kitchen. I'm a kid. A kid in the kitchen. So uh, there's a, a few of us who have children ages four through 12. Come closer, sweetie. And they do a show every other month. So the next show is, do you remember what your next show is about? Mm. Salads. Oh yeah. Yeah, and what was your last show? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? Smoothie. Soup. Uh, Soup. Soup yeah. Favorite winter foods. And next week, they are, they are hosting Brenda Davis, one of my favorite nutritionists, and Reshma Shah. They wrote a book. So please tune in next week. How is it, Anu? Good? Great. And I didn't put much jerk seasoning. Did I put a little bit? Can you taste a little bit? Okay. And it's nice and soft, nice flavors. So there you have it. Um, jerk seasoned vegetables or tofu, easy to do. Uh, seasonings, we're going to show you so many good seasonings and spices today. One thing I didn't mention is that uh, herbs, seasoning, spices tend to have lots of great health benefits. For example, cinnamon tastes good. It tastes sweet. But did you know that cinnamon actually helps reduce your, the, the sugar in your blood? So it's a great food to eat, tastes sweet, but is actually good for your glycemic. It reduces your glycemic load. Uh, ginger is great. Ginger helps you with digestion. It helps reduce nausea. Uh, it's good when you're eating beans if you're not tolerant of beans. So there's so many benefits. Fenugreek, if you have a friend who's pregnant, it helps, or, or who has had a baby, it helps with lactation. So a lot of these natural foods, uh, spices and herbs have a lot of great health benefits as well as flavor benefits. So the last thing I should say is when you cook the tofu or the vegetables, put it in your air fryer. I try three, 375 degrees Fahrenheit for five to six minutes. If you want it crispy, turn it up to 425 for another two to four minutes. I'm reluctant to give times because each air fryer is different. You might be saying, Dilip, I don't have an air fryer, no problem. You can also just bake it. So put it in an oven at similar temperatures, maybe 25 degrees warmer, and, and you should have a good result. But fine tune the, the time and temperature to your taste and the textures you like. So thank you. And with that, I'm excited to pass the torch on 
to Jeannine Orhan in Italy, who's going to be talking about her Gomasio mix. Take it away, Jeannine. Thank you, Philip. What a wonderful introduction to seasonings, herbs, spices. I learned a lot from listening to you. Um, welcome, everybody, to my kitchen at Pesciolata Lorsi here in northern Italy. And this evening, I will be talking to you about Gomasio. It's a um, Japanese seasoning or condiment, maybe you might want to call it that. Um, it's something I found out about many years ago, and ever since then, it's become a favorite in our house to use as a seasoning for many, many reasons. Gomasio, the word, means um, sesame salt. So in the basic recipe, the two ingredients are sesame and salt, as the name implies. This one is um, a little different. Um, you can also, in the shops, find many different varieties of gomasio. So here, let me tell you about my recipe. Um, this one, uh, just to let you know, I like to make it fresh each time I use it. Therefore, I've given a very small dose recipe on, um, in our recipe booklet, which you can find online. But you can, of course, always make a larger batch and keep it in a jar in the fridge so you can use it for a longer period. So basically, you have one tablespoon of sesame seeds. I prefer using unhulled ones because they have more fiber, more nutrients. And I have one tablespoon of wakame seafood. And I put the two of them in a very tiny cast iron pan. And I love this little thing. Um, I couldn't resist buying it years ago. And it's become my favorite for using with warming up spices and other items. So you basically um, let them toast a little bit. Uh, keep an eye so they don't burn. Uh, the recipe also has a quarter teaspoon of turmeric powder and um, four or five peppercorns. And of course, you can adjust any of these to your liking if you like things more spicy. And a, a one eighth of a teaspoon or just a pinch of um, rock salt or sea salt. And you keep toasting your goodies. And um, so they're here. These are toasting. It's just a few seconds of. Um, patience while they toast and get a little bit of color. It doesn't take too long. The, the, I had warmed up the pan, so the sesames are beginning to toast already. Um, and there's a nice smell coming out of them. And so here they are. I think I'm ready to cook them. When you put the warmed up sesame seeds into your mortar, give them a nice um, twirl, mix them a little. And at this moment, you can really smell the turmeric. It's just really, really pleasant. And if you like herbs and spices, as I do, I think you'll really love making this on your own. So when they're in the mortar, I like to put a piece of paper under it, keep it from making noises. You just gently um, mix it, um, give it a few pumps just like this to break the peppercorns. And it doesn't take long. You can, of course, grind it to your liking. You can leave it um, more coarse, or you can make it as fine as you want. Oh, the smell of the sesame seeds, mixing it with all the, the turmeric. The, the goodness of this thing is that you can also add, if you wish, um, spicy chili peppers to it to give it a more of a, a kick, but um, play with it at home and come to a recipe that you prefer making. Um, sometimes maybe you prefer to have it a bit more spicy with black pepper as well. So you can see how it's blending up and the seaweed is chopped up too. And I'll just give it another couple twirls. Of course, you can, um, as Dilip had mentioned, you can put it into like a coffee grinder to chop them really fine, but a little bit of exercise is good in the kitchen. So here they are. This is the consistency that I like. 
and it has a pretty yellow color to it. And the, the odors coming from it are the aromas is just wonderful. And you can see how lovely it is. And here we go. This is one serving for me, not just for me. This is something I can make for the table and so people can um, scoop it out and then sprinkle it on their foods. Now, where do I use it? For example, I sprinkle it on uh, rice or pasta or I sprinkle it into cashew sour cream to give a little bit more flavor to it. Or um, if I make sushi, I sprinkle a little bit of this in it. So the sushi that I eat, it's um, more flavorful. Or I put it uh, on the table and you can dip your sushi in it. It goes lovely with crudités. If you have um, carrot sticks or um, celery sticks, you can also dip them in and um, eat them. They're lovely. So this wonderful um, spicy and seaweedy salty mixture that also has wonderful uh, nutritional values for you. Uh, for example, seaweed, uh, seaweed has a lot of iodine and the World Health Organization has set the limits um, at about 150 micrograms per adult per day. And one tablespoon of wakame, dried wakame seaweed will give you 600 micrograms, so which is in this mix. So it's a lot more than your daily requirement. Therefore, something like this is good to use on the table if you just sprinkle a little bit. Now you can also get iodine from iodized salt. And basically, if on a daily basis you use iodized salt, you, you shouldn't have uh, trouble with your iodine levels. Um, the main ingredient, which is sesame seeds, are full of calcium. So one tablespoon of um, sesame seeds will give you 88 milligrams of calcium. So that's a lot and very good addition to our daily um, calcium requirements. And also the other ingredient, the lovely yellow color, comes from the turmeric. And turmeric is a wonderful um, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, therefore eating it regularly in your food in small doses also helps with um, many ailments. Um, so my recipe today was very easy and I have news because this is probably the last um, show I'm doing from my kitchen here in Italy because next month I'll be greeting you from Abu Dhabi. So a whole new adventure in my life. And um, I'd like to also take the opportunity to thank my friend Thor, who is behind the camera right now. And I don't know if he can do a selfie mode. <laughs> he's laughing at me, he can't. Um, because he's been helping us from the beginning, um, from our very, very first show on so many cooks um, in the kitchen. Thor has been here helping us out. And he's blushing. You should see how red he is now. It's my shirt reflecting off his face. And before I say goodbye and hope to see you in Abu Dhabi, I'd like to remind you to please do try this at home. This is a wonderful recipe. And send us um, your comments on how you use it. I'd love to learn what you might use it for. And speaking of um, comments, please, um, if you're watching the show live right now, send us questions. If you have any questions, we're going to be answering them at the end of the show. So you can write your questions on, on Facebook. And also, please remember, all our recipes will be on Facebook available as a booklet for you. So you can also go back to the booklet to get the full recipes. And with that, I'll say um, arrivederci and pass it on to my good friend, Karen Osborne in Austin, Texas, who will be talking about airberry spices. Bye for now and arrivederci. Thanks, Jonathan. That's delicious looking, and I wish I could taste it right now. Healthy and delicious is great. Um, that's what all of these spices are. So the one I'm going to talk to you about today is one of my favorites, um, Berbere. It's an Ethiopian spice, uh, spice blend. It's also the name of a pepper. But um, the blend is uh, 
it's like the most used flavoring in Ethiopian cooking. And I love it because it's just, it allows you to easily add a lot of flavor to your dishes. Um, so a bunch of, um, like it's thought to have originated like in the fifth century when um, the merchants would bring spices back to, from China and uh, different, you know, they appear in the marketplace and families would experiment with all these interesting flavors. So all the families and, and even different regions came up with their own um, different blends. So you can have two uh, blends that have, like I have the exact same ingredients in these two blends, but they taste different. Uh, maybe because of the proportions, but it was a, it's a blend of 12 to 25 spices. And they usually start with a, with chili pepper, dried chili peppers, and you want the seeds removed. And most of them include uh, fenugreek, paprika, coriander, cardamom, uh, black pepper, cinnamon, and cloves. And then they add a, a lot of different warming spices to that um, base. And um, you can buy them in international markets um, or online easily. They, I used to be able to buy them in a bigger grocery store here, but I haven't seen them in the past year. But um, you can also make your own. And I've put a recipe in our recipe document. And that one has coriander seeds, uh, cumin seeds, fenugreek seeds, black peppercorns, uh, cardamom pods, um, and then uh, cloves, um, the red chilies. I put a little salt in there. You, you can leave it out. It's great if you don't use salt. Um, paprika, ginger, cinnamon, and turmeric. And if you're making your own, you can find a lot of different recipes online for this. Um, and some of them just tell you to combine a bunch of powdered spices and then you have your blend. But if you want to, I think it's great if you um, toast the individual spices um, first, like if you have the whole spices, toast them each alone because they don't, they take a different amount of time. All of them toast up really quick, but it takes just a different amount of time for them to become fragrant and done. So once you've toasted each whole spice that you have and put it in a bowl, just let it cool. And then you can put it in a coffee grinder or a spice grinder, grind that up, and then add the powder, any powdered spices that you're using, uh, combine those, grind it again. Then you have this wonderful blend. Um, the only thing I was gonna tell you, like the coriander seeds, you're gonna toast them whole uh, like that. And then you want to open them and take out what's in the middle. You can toss the pod and actually use what comes out of the, out of the pod for your spice blend. And what I am going to do, they're really full of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, good for cardiovascular system, uh, blood pressure, your immune system, even uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. Uh, but this is a, a spicy spice, it's hot. So you're just gonna use probably just a little. Um, and so I haven't given like a definite amount because you're gonna use it to taste. Just start slow and then add more to taste. Um, I'm gonna show you real quick one of the, um, it's a my take on a traditional Ethiopian dish that I love and it's uh, spicy red lentils. And what I did is I had a whole uh, large red onion and I um, diced it small. And then I sauteed it until it was uh, translucent. And then I put in six Roma tomatoes, which is about a pound of tomatoes and some garlic. Uh, the tomatoes I just put in the food processor, chopped them up, you can chop them by hand. Uh, it's just gonna cook down to a paste. And then I put the spice in there spice blend. And then I cooked it all down to a paste. And now what I'm going to do is add, I have red lentils that have been uh, rinsed and drained. And they've been sitting too long. They're stuck. All right. So I'm going to put the lentils in. 
and then put uh, water. You can use water or vegetable broth. Traditionally, it was water. And if you put vegetable broth, it might uh, cut the, the heat a little bit. So that's your choice. So then I'm gonna, I would stir it up and put it on the stove and let it come to a boil. And then uh, once it comes to a boil, I'm gonna cover it and um, let it cook for up to, uh, reduce the heat, let it simmer for about 40 minutes. Uh, you just want the lentils to get cooked nice and, and soft. And you know, the longer you've had the lentils, the older they are, the longer it's gonna to take to cook. But uh, once that's done, um, I will take the cover off and taste it. Add a little more spice if you want more spice. Add salt at that point if you want some salt. And then um, cook it for about two to five more minutes, stirring it occasionally until it's nice and thick. And then I'm serving it over, it's traditionally served over in Jira, which is their uh, spongy flatbread. It's fermented teff, which is a really good grain. It's um, got a lot of protein. It's a complete protein. Uh, so it, I don't have any organic teff. I just fermented uh, buckwheat and did the same thing. Um, the uh, cilantro on top is, my, is not in their traditional cooking. They used the seeds, not really the, the leaves, but it's yummy. Uh, another thing you can do with this spice is I have a little uh, plant-based yogurt and I am just going to add a little spice to it. Yep, more than a little and stir it up and um, this makes a nice dip for vegetables or you could put it over a baked potato that's yummy put it over your greens and i have a bowl of um, yukon gold potatoes and greens and i'm just gonna throw over there my sauce you could add some garbanzo beans to this and have a complete meal any kind of beans really um, and then the other thing that I'm going to show you really quick is uh, I have some cooked garbanzo beans and I have patted them dry with a paper towel. You can do that uh, with a clean towel if you, if you want. Um, and then I just put the spice in and I am I'm stirring it up. And then I'm going to put it on a parchment lined cookie sheet. And then I'm gonna uh, bake it at 400 degrees for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. These are small beans, so they'll probably be done in 45 minutes, but you wanna stir them every 15 minutes to keep them from burning. And also like during that last 15 minutes, you really wanna check it often to make sure it's not burning. And then they're good um, as a crouton on a salad or you can, they're crunchy. You can just eat them like, like they are as a snack, or you can not bake them and just season them and put them on a salad. They're good that way too. And I'm sure you can think of a thousand other things to do with this spice. I hope you'll try it. It's uh, just remember to start small, take, um, it's just easier to add more than it is to take it away if the heat is too strong. So thanks for watching. And now we're gonna to go to Chicago and see what Mark has cooking up for us today. Take it away, Mark. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Mark Cirkvenik here in Chicago. My company is letseatgreat.com. You can find me at letseatgreat.com or on Facebook at Let's Eat Great Food. So today I'm gonna to do something just a little different. Um, you know, uh, some of the, uh, the, the cooks that you saw already were cooking with some spices and particular powdered, you know, spices, if you will, and dried spices. And some people after me will be using some fresh spices as well. Well, my, the two spices that I'm going to talk about today are really classics. And the first one is a super classic ingredient, and it is called mirepoix. Mirepoix, it's actually named after a gentleman from the uh, 18th century. So we're looking at an ingredient that is the base to so many soups, stews, and stocks, and, and so many recipes. And I think this will sound really familiar. So a mirepoix, the classic mirepoix is uh, celery, 
carrots and onions. And the idea with mirepoix is that you want to sweat it. So you want to cook it low and slow. And what that does is it releases the essential sugars, the, the natural sugars, and adds all those wonderful uh, tastes and, and, and um, flavors and everything to the dish. So if you think back and you go look at some of your recipes, you'll probably see a lot of your recipes has some combination of this triune of celery, carrots, and onions. So the neat thing is, is, is you look at the classic mirepoix, um, the uh, recipes will say, you know, use oil, which in whole food plant-based cooking that Food for Life instructors teach and PCRM uh, supports is that we don't use oil. But the recipe, classic recipe, again, calls for oil. Well, in mirepoix, classic mirepoix, we never want to brown or um, really brown and fry the food. We always want to keep it low and slow. So this is like perfect for um, our, our style of cooking, and that is to really saute these vegetables, this mirepoix, this trial in water. So what I'm going to do is really simple, and those of you that have watched it, watch our shows in the past or perhaps taken food for life classes or familiar with this water sauteing, it is you take a really hot pan and add add some water to it and let that let that just kind of heat up and get nice and warm. Uh, continue to get nice and warm. And then all we do is we just, we just dump our, our mirepoix in this. Now I've got uh, three cups of onions and two cups of celery and two cups of carrots. And this is going to make a pretty substantial base or mirepoix for um, whatever I'm going to end up cooking. Now, you, you will see this in your recipes. You go back and you look at your recipes. You'll probably see this in for uh, uh, sauteing various dishes, beans, and so forth. You might see this in uh, a stew, and you might see this uh, the same mixture or some um, combination of this mixture for a stock or, or a blended stock. So with that said, um, the question really becomes, well, how big do I, how big do I cut the, uh, the mirepoix in? So well, that really depends on how you're gonna use it. You'll see in this one, I've kind of cut them about a half inch to an inch. And so that'll be really good for like a stew. So that's kind of a medium cut. If you're sauteing it for making the mirepoix for like, maybe a bean dish or a rice dish, where um, you're actually gonna um, you know, incorporate it with, with many, many other ingredients, you're gonna cut it smaller, so like a quarter to a half inch. Now, if you're doing some kind of blended soup or you're, you know, you're, you're cooking all your soup up and then before you serve it, you're, you're putting it in a blender or you're taking an emulsion blender uh, and, um, and blending it, you can leave it pretty big at an inch or so. Uh, you know, half inch to an inch. So this is going to cook again, low and slow. So I'm going to turn the heat down, and this is going to cook for about probably 10, 15 minutes. Again, the the term is sweating it. So you're going to sweat these vegetables, get it all ready, and uh, then um, continue with your uh, with your uh, recipe. So that's a uh, that's 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 what a mere ply is. So the next time you play Trivial Pursuit, if anybody ever plays it, or or, or you're watching Jeopardy, and uh, they say what's a, what a mere plot is, you'll know um, that it's from the, uh, it was invented back in the 18th century, and it's that triune of carrots, celery, and onions. So my next one is another uh, iteration, if you will, so to speak, on this uh, topic of using some fresh ingredients. And this is a sofrito, not a sofrita, I know sofritas are really popular now in some fast food restaurants. And by and large, um, uh, whole food, plant-based food, you really can't find a lot of good food in fast food restaurants. It's typically high in fat, uh, high in salt, and uh, just really, really not within the realm of what we believe is, is, is healthy food. But um, this is sofrito, and this is a Puerto Rican sofrito. Uh, sofritos are typically popular in Central and South American countries and Latin American uh, cuisines, and um, it's it's really it, you 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 won't believe how easy this frito is. And this is a, again another spice, if you will. 
and um, all you do is you take um, some vegetables and the recipe that I've included, and by the way, the links to all of our recipes um, are, are on our Facebook page and you'll see it pop up occasionally as well through our uh, chat function on our Facebook page for today's live show. Um, the recipe calls it a Puerto Rican and it has specific, some specific uh, uh, vegetables in it. Now, there's so many different variations on the sofrito. But the idea is, is that the, originally the sofrito was really used for baked or barbecued or roasted uh, meats. Well, we, you know, that of course isn't part of our whole food plant-based diet, but we can certainly use this in tofus and rice, rice dishes, or just as a salsa too with some nice baked, baked tortilla chips. So I'm gonna show you how easy this sofrito so, so is. So all we're gonna do is take some uh, sweet red peppers. Um, I'm gonna take uh, some onions and the specific, again, ingredients to make a big batch is, is in the recipes. We're gonna take um, some cilantro. If you don't like cilantro, leave it out with parsley and garlic. Um, and um, the, one, the one additional item I'm gonna add is, is a green pepper. And for those of you that haven't seen this before on the show or aren't familiar, I'm gonna show you a really easy way to cut up a green pepper. You cut off the top, cut off the bottom, slice it down the side, and then just go ahead and uh, cut these bitter uh, insides out. And all we're gonna do is just cut this in a big chunk, because this is all gonna get blended and made into a really nice uh, sofrito. Again, which is like very, very fresh seasoning and just the aromatics. And you can smell the fresh vegetables here and then putting them into the food process. You wouldn't believe it. So I'm going to blend this a little bit here. And uh, it would probably be really helpful if I put uh, the blade in. So, <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's one thing you always want to do with a, with a food processor is put the blade in and uh, get, the, get that thing right down in there. And, uh, and away we go. So, um, all right. And now, I just blend, 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 blend. And that's really all, that's really all it takes. And the beautiful thing about this, after you remember to put the blade in it, I have that heavy. Yesterday I put gas in the car and probably did what we all have done from time to time. I, I've, I've, I've done this a couple times in the last year. Might have something to do with going on in, in the world today and how distracted we are. But if you're going to put the gas can. So, anyways, um, so a look at this sofrito. Isn't it just lovely? What can you use it on? I mean, I put it on rice, put it with beans, a side of beans, and put the nacho chips. Would love to see in your comments uh, on our Facebook Live page today during the show. What, how, what, how else you might use the sofrito? You could also do a spicy sofrito, so put some hot peppers in there. It all kind of really depends on um, what you to use it for. You can put it in a jar like this. Um, got this uh, jar while we were on vacation in Ireland uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, keep that in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks. Pull it out and throw it on a salad or use it in dishes. But I'd be really interested to see what how else people might want to use the sofrito, this fresh vegetable. So um, cooking away is my mirepoix. It's moving along here for about another five or seven minutes. It'll be all done. And with that, folks, again, look me up at letseatgreat.com or on Facebook at Let's Eat Great Food. And I want to turn it over to from the from the north of Chicago down to southern uh, part of this part of the country to Atlanta. The, uh, Shobaswami, take it away. Thank you so much, Mark. That was amazing. Welcome, everybody. And uh, it's a pleasure to show you all the seasonings. Um, just want to show you everything that I have set up here. I'm Shobaswami from Atlanta. And as you all know, we're all Food for Life instructors and you can see the lovely um, presentation I have here today of all the wonderful spices. Dilip, sorry, Dilip already introduced you to the spices and, and you've seen quite a bit of them. But I would just like to show you some things that, um, that you can you know, keep ready at home with regards to Indian spices, 
And here I'll be showcasing to you um, the spice box that Dilip mentioned, which has uh, turmeric, which already uh, Akanan already mentioned. And then all these other herbs and spices are from the um, East, which is, you know, India used to be the spice trade capital um, way back a few thousands of years ago, uh, hundreds of years ago as well. And so we have turmeric here. We have, th this is coriander seeds powdered up. So cilantro is called coriander in India. And the cilantro seeds you can find at the Indian grocery store that's lightly roasted sometimes and sometimes just powdered up like this. Uh, and it adds a lovely flavor and aroma. And then we have cumin powder that's used not only in Indian cooking, but in many of the Latino cooking as well, and many Latin And I love that spice. Here's cumin itself. Sometimes we use raw cumin in our cooking, and sometimes we use roasted. That adds a wonderful flavor as well. These are some traditional South Indian seasonings of uh, some lentils dry roasted. Typically, it's uh, roasted in a little bit of oil, but here I've dry roasted them and get them ready for some of the South Indian cooking. And of course, our very favorite red chili powder, you know? So this is the box that Dilip was mentioning that we usually prepare. And it's, it's a wonderful tradition in India that the mothers, you know, give their daughters. And I'm sure these days, the sons as well, because everybody's cooking nowadays. Um, a wonderful box where you can keep all keep track of all your spices that you would need and all in one box. So I teach at a medical school here in Atlanta and I have put together another spice box with some nutritional yeast here, some garlic powder, some salt, some red pepper flakes. So when I go to teach at that school, uh, if people want to add some more flavor than what they have, um, this is another kind of a dibba that I have that uh, I carry. And here's what's called kala namak. Though it's attracted to black salt, it's actually in color. And it adds the smell of, um, you know, the eggy smell. And that's what you can use for even your uh, tofu scramble. Or if you're making an omelet, you can use this. And it adds an eggy smell to the food. And it's just amazing. We use that in quite a bit of our cooking. And here's again, this is something that I travel with. This is all kinds of Indian spices, which is very similar, that, but curry powder and others that are pre-prepared, garam masala and curry powder that are a spice blend from India. And you can find many recipes. And I think Dilip's going has put a recipe in for you as well of what it's made of. So I carry this when we go on vacation even. And I've made this so that they have little lids on each of them so they don't get mixed up between them. Traditionally, they don't come with a lid, but I've made that. And I want to introduce you today to ginger, like I think Khanan or somebody mentioned, it's not only anti-inflammatory, it's an amazing spice to add to your tea. You can make, um, you know, it, it helps to cure colds and sore throats. And uh, you can buy, uh, you know, ginger at your local grocery store. I prefer to pick up organic ginger because it's a lot more flavorful and uh, a little goes a long way. Sometimes it can get too spicy too. So be careful about how much ginger you add. But I want to teach you a trick about adding ginger to beans. It helps in digestion and it's an anti-inflammatory as well. So it has medicinal properties, but it really helps in digestion as well. And so when you add it, to like Indian curries, which are made of beans like chickpeas or black eyed peas or kidney beans called rajma, a dish that we make, then it helps you digest the beans also very easily. So a good trick to keep this handy is um, I buy this and then scrub it down and soak it in water for a little bit to get any little residual um, mud out of it since it grows underground. And then I crush it in my food processor and freeze it in ice cube trays like this. And so I have a Ziploc bag of cubed iced ginger at any time. 
These can be broken down into smaller pieces as well. If you can just take a knife and chop it down. And I do the same with jalapenos. I do the same with Thai chili peppers. And so you have your very own little squares that you get to buy nowadays in many stores. But this, all, this practice of ours started way before it was available in the stores. So you can do this with other herbs and other seasonings as well, especially the fresh herbs. If you buy a big bunch of dill, for example, you may not use all of it, but feel free to save it in ice cube tray. And that will really help you in the long run. And then I'm going to show you, I have a small little spice jar and a spice blender here that I use to blend all the different spice blends. So um, explore the seasonings and uh, have a wonderful time with the tasty, delicious food. You know, whole foods, plant-based cooking is all about eating delicious food, but that's heart healthy and uh, makes you uh, vibrant and active. Thank you very much. And I will be passing on the baton to, uh, just a second, Nancy, who's going to make spice root vegetable curry. On to you, Nancy. Nancy Manifold. Thank you, Shoka. I'm Nancy Manifold, and thank you everybody for joining me, and it's, it's so nice to see everybody. Um, I'm Canadian, but I have lived in England for the last 35 years. I moved here after university, and one of the first things my new colleagues, my work colleagues in England did, was to take me out for a curry. And honestly, I was blown away. I had actually never had a curry, which seems remarkable. And it was the start of a 35-year love affair. And I can honestly say that I, I think I've had a curry every week uh, for the last 35 years, at least once a week. It's also when I came here the year I met my husband, but that's a completely different love affair. And I'm not going to tell you about that one. I'm going to tell you about my curry love affair. So a curry meal is one of the easiest meals to make. It's, it's incredibly simple. And what I would like to do is take you through my version of a curry. It's not complicated, it's very simple. And what I'm going to do is start with the rice because in England anyway, when we have a curry, we tend to eat it on a bed of rice and it's absolutely delicious. So let me get my pan. In order to take rice, to, so I have some brown basmati rice here, all right? You can soak it and that reduces the cooking time. I haven't soaked this. To take your rice to the next level, and it is unbelievably delicious, it's a physician's committee recipe and it's unbelievably simple. And it's taking one cinnamon stick, just put it, there's nothing in that pan. There's, there's no water, no oil, no nothing two cardamom pods, which I have crushed with the back of a knife, just, just to open them up a little bit, and one whole clove. So I don't know if you can see that. Just one whole clove, because clove is actually quite pungent and quite strong. And I've got the heat on, and you just let that toast, just dry toast for about a minute, until you can start to get the aromas. And it's unbelievably gorgeous. One of the problems with doing things on Facebook is you can't smell this food, um, but it's absolutely lovely. And when you can start to get the smell of the spices as they're toasting, you then add your rice. And I have a cup of the rice here, the brown basmati rice. There we go. And then you just add that in and again, stir it just for a minute, just to toast the rice a bit. And it gives it a nice nutty flavor. Very, very nice, okay? So I've toasted that. I would normally toast it for a little bit longer, but I'm not going to make you stand and watch, sit and watch while I toast that. But I would toast it for about a minute. And then I have, I have here one and a half cups of water. I know the recipe says two cups. I tend to use a little bit less because I cook it until it's dry. I don't cook it and then drain it. So then I add the water. And you can hear it sizzling a little bit. And it's just bubbling. Okay, stir that in. And I will just get the lid. 
and you let that come to a, a gentle boil. And then when it's at a gentle boil, turn it down to a simmer. And for brown rice, it tends to be about 40 minutes. White rice is about 25 minutes, but for brown rice, it's 40 minutes. And I'm just going to put that on the burner behind me and let that continue to cook. The other way to cook rice, which is incredibly simple, is to do all of that, but actually put it in the oven at about 200 degrees Celsius, which I think is about 425 degrees Fahrenheit. I am bilingual between English and American, so it's one of my life skills, I have to say. But it's 200 degrees Celsius, which is what we do in England. And so you can actually just put it in the oven for 40 minutes and let it bake, and it's, it's, it's never failed. What I'm going to show you now is a recipe for a curry. Now, one of the beautiful things about this recipe that I've got is it's very inexpensive. It's using root vegetables, which uh, I think are probably the cheapest, least expensive vegetables in the supermarket. And this recipe was actually um, given to me by a woman who cooks for a food bank. And uh, they don't, at the food bank, they don't have the luxury of expensive ingredients for the most part. So that just gives you an idea of uh, how inexpensive it is. And as I say, it's very quick and easy because what you don't want is a complicated recipe when you get home from work uh, or the kids get home from school, anything like that. You want something quick and something easy and it also freezes very well. So I know Mark has already gone through with you about uh, cooking with water. So this is water. Okay, so I put a little bit of water in just until it starts to steam. Let me bring this forward. So we don't use oil. Oil is wasted calories. So with Food for Life cooking, it is not calorie counting. That's one of the beautiful things about it. I'm just putting the, the onion in now. It's one of the beautiful things about it that's not calorie counting. But one thing to be aware of is the calories in oil. I'm not asking you to count them, but it's just to be aware of it. And if I put, which I haven't, but if I put even a tablespoon of oil in this to start cooking and frying, that's 125 calories because oil is nine calories a gram. And it's, it's absolutely and utterly wasted calories because you will never taste it in the finished product. And 125 calories is actually 5% of the daily calories for your average woman. And it's, it's completely wasted. Uh, and it's part, you can brown your vegetables, you can do everything with um, sauteing in water, right? And what you do is you, you cook this up and when it starts to stick and brown a little bit, you just add a little bit more water and you get the, a great flavor with that. You get a little bit, so you start to turn the heat up. So you just scrape the slightly darkened bits off the bottom and it just adds to the richness of the flavor, okay? And what I'm going to do now is, I would have normally let this cook a little bit longer, about three or four minutes until the onion's translucent, but I'm going to move it on a little bit. And here we have two large chopped potatoes. I'm going to add this in. And four sliced carrots, peeled and sliced. Okay. And parsnip. Now, I don't know if parsnip is that common in the United States, uh, but it's one diced, it's actually two parsnips. I've done one because it's huge. So this is this is what a parsnip looks like. There's a parsnip. Okay, can you see it? It, it looks a bit like a white carrot, a, a quite a large white carrot. Okay, and it has a little bit of a sweeter, but at the same time more earthy flavor than a carrot. Let me just put a bit more water in there because it's sticking just a little bit. And then what you can do with this is stir it for about five or six minutes, if you like. You don't have to, but you can if you want to brown the vegetables a little bit, okay? And what I am going to do is now add the stock. So I have one liter of vegetable stock. So vegetable stock is vegetable broth. And you want low salt because again, it's a waste of salt to have it post, um, have it high salt stock. 
So this is vegetable stock or vegetable broth, one liter, which is the same as four cups. I'm just going to pour that in. Okay. And turn the heat up a little bit. And now this is where the curry comes in, the curry powder. So I have mild curry powder because I don't have, uh, oh, sorry, wrong way. I don't have a great palate for spicy food. So curry powder, this is, I use my glasses because I, I've already told you that I came here 35 years ago after university. So you know I'm old enough to need reading glasses. I'll let you do the math. Curry powder is, it, it's a beautiful blend of spices and it has coriander, turmeric, onion, cumin, ginger, garlic, galangal, lemongrass, white pepper, and cayenne. And it is unbelievably delicious. And it's such an easy recipe because it's all in here and all you have to do is put in two tablespoons and you've got all of your flavoring right there. And one of the beautiful things about spices, nicely spiced food, is you don't need oil and you don't need salt because you don't need those flavors. You've got all of these beautiful spices for your flavors. And turning this up a bit and stirring that in, and then the last thing, well, the second last thing I want to show you is the lentils. So I think it was Karen who discovered her lentils were stuck together. And when, when I saw that, I immediately went back and loosened up my lentils. They do stick. Now, the beauty of lentils in cooking is quite often in a curry, you will find in a curry that people use uh, coconut cream in order to thicken their curry. And coconut cream is full of fat and it's full of saturated fat. Which is, which is a high risk food for heart disease. Lentils, red lentils, they soften and break up as you cook them and they thicken the curry. And lentils, unlike coconut cream, are incredibly healthy. So the lentils here, so this is half a cup of lentils, which I have rinsed. Uh, you don't have to, but I have rinsed. Lentils and the rice, the bed of rice, are very good sources of what are called resistant starches. And resistant starches are foods, I'm just bringing this to the boil now. Resistant starches are foods, uh, starchy foods, that the body doesn't have the enzymes to break them down into their individual glucose molecules. And so some of that starch, because it can't be digested, it makes its way all the way down to the large bowel which the bacteria in the large bowel love, and they, they feast on it. And in return, they thank us, the bacteria thank us by turning those resistant starches into something called short chain fatty acids, which is food for the cells, our cells, that line our gut. It's, it's the, the relationship between humans and plants is a beautiful thing, to put it mildly. It is an extraordinary relationship. So these resistant starches, and also the potato in here. If you cook this and decide to eat it tomorrow, so the potato is cooled, it also changes to resistant starch, and your bacteria will love you for it, I'm telling you. So we cook this for 20 minutes, and what happens in that time is these lentils break down and create this beautiful, thick curry sauce, all right? Now, I'm not going to make you wait for 20 minutes to see that. You'd be pleased to hear. So I'm going to do our, here's one I made earlier. And here I have my curry. So what I've done is I've added coriander or cilantro. As I said, I'm bilingual. Uh, so I've added the chopped coriander after it's been cooked. This is a batch I made earlier. And then I've also sprinkled some coriander on top. Now, before you put coriander in your food or cilantro in your food, in your meal, it's important to find out if everybody you're feeding likes it because curiously, some people have a gene that makes coriander taste like soap or dirt or bugs, insects. Um, and as Michael Greger quite rightly points out, how people know what insects taste like, who knows, but um, that's what it does. So some people, it just tastes not great, the coriander. So, Excuse me, always check that. Uh, I love coriander. Um, so there we go. I'm just going to turn this down before I burn my stew. 
my curry. And that's the story of my love affair with curry because I know this is going to be absolutely delicious. And it's quick and it's easy and it freezes very well. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm passing you over to Denise Perro, who is going to tell you how to make her delicious Thai curry paste. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. So keeping with a little bit of a United Kingdom theme tonight, uh, I'm here in Bokhavar, Scotland. So I'm way, 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 way north, north, north um, of our last person, but it's all good. Um, I uh, am American, but I came to Scotland via the Netherlands. It's a story for another time, um, but I too have had a love affair with curry uh, since I learned about it, which, is, which was actually not until I really moved to Europe that I really um, started to appreciate it. But I'm not going to talk about Indian curry conveniently enough because we had an absolutely fantastic um, discussion about that a few minutes ago, really informative. I'm gonna talk about Thai curry. And I absolutely love Thai curry. I think it's fantastic. And I'm gonna talk specifically about red Thai curry paste. I've made it. And one of the weird things about my presentation today is I'm not going to do any cooking and you'll understand why you wouldn't hear anything because all you would hear would be grinding and blending and things. But I've made a Thai curry paste. And what inspired me to make a red Thai curry paste of my own were a couple things. The first thing was that I found it very difficult to find them uh, vegan. A lot of times you have to be very, very careful when you pick the packaged ones, if you've ever done that and you look and you have to make sure that they're vegan. And then if they were vegan, um, a hundred percent of the time, in my experience, at least, they always had oil in them. And obviously oil is something I don't want to waste my calories on. None of us do. It's very unhealthy for us. And it's going to be a useless ingredient when, when we're making our own curry. So I decided that I would make my own curry paste. And one of the things that happened, which seems to always happen whenever I start diving into spices, is I discovered that it was just so much better. Um, and so I've been making curry paste now for several years. Um, what I love about this, and I think Shova brought it up as well, this is another one of those things that you can make and you can freeze. And I usually freeze this. This is a quite hot curry paste. When I start to explain how it's made, you're gonna go, oh my gosh. Um, you can calm it down. I'll help, I'll help you how uh, and how. But uh, one of the things you can do is usually put one to two tablespoons, put it away in a little freezer container. Sometimes I've even used little baggies and things. And then you just pop that out and you have curry paste ready to go. So let's talk about how we made it. And then I'm gonna give you some tips on how I like to use it. And um, I choose easy always. So I'm gonna show you some really easy ways to use it. Um, there are a few whole herbs. I think you don't, this is really important when you're making this kind of a curry paste that you wanna really start with some good whole herbs. So um, let's see what we've got here. I started with some coriander seeds. You can just see they're just a brown kind of a seed. They look a little like a, I don't know if I can get that for you, a little kind of a bird seedy thing. Um, so I've got those, my coriander seeds, and I've got some white peppercorns. Um, these are all things you can, you can buy very easily. I think these all came over from the Netherlands with me, by the way, so they're all marked in Dutch dead giveaway. Um, and then I have some cumin seeds. So this isn't the ground cumin that you buy, it's so good. Somebody talked about this. Uh, this is really their kind of seeds. They have a real frag, they're really fragrant smell. And then the fourth dry spice, if you want to call it that, that I'm going to use are red chilies. Now, uh, I, have a, I have a food blog. And so on the recipe, I've told people to use 10 dried chilies. So this is the kind I've got. Um, they're not a bird's eye chili. They're kind of a mid-range chili. Um, I got this, uh, it's just whole chili at the Chinese market. So I've experimented with these. Um, if you end up using a tiny chili, like a bird's eye chili, the really teeny ones, you will want to cut back on those. Um, a lot of labels will be, will tell you whether they're hot or not. 
I actually bought this at a at a very strict Chinese market. There's really, it's probably marked, but it's probably marked in, it's either in China, yeah, it is in Chinese, not even in Dutch. Um, so one way that I mitigate it, uh, not having uh, the, the chilies be so hot is that I actually break them open. Um, oh, I have a little, little guy here that I use. So I actually break them open, tear them open, and then I kind of shake out the seeds. So you can see I have a whole thing full of seeds from making it early. We really like hot things in our house. So I'm not as diligent about this when I'm making it for us. I was very diligent about this one because I'm giving this one to my daughter and the little children. And so they'll want something a little more on the mellow side. And once I um, took care of my chilies and I got the seeds out, what I did was I grabbed a, a pan. This is a really heavy cast iron pan. It's my favorite for this kind of thing. And I just toasted all of these spices, these whole spices. So the coriander, the cumin seeds, the white peppercorns, and these lovely dried chilies. And I just toasted them for maybe one to two minutes. Um, if you use one of these cast iron pots and if you have skillets and you've used them a lot, you'll know when I say, when you cut the heat, they keep on, they keep on cooking. So I went for about a minute. I cut the heat down and I got them out of there because I knew that they might start to start to get a little too brown. The other trick I want to say about toasting spices is you want to be sure that you have something and you're just constantly moving them. Move, move, move. It's the same theory behind the no oil saute. The more you move things, the less time they have to get associated with the bottom of your pan. And in this case, burn. Um, when I did the spices earlier for this particular chili paste, I will share with you it was pretty fragrant. So fortunately, we have absolutely lovely weather here so we could get the door kind of wafting a little bit and get some of that out. It was quite strong uh, between the chilies and the things. And once I had those chilies done, then I went on to fetch some other spices and some other herbs. This is quite a hot uh, red chili paste. It's also um, really leans in toward the citrus. So some of the other things that I used, um, I started out with, um, in no particular order, I used four cloves of garlic. So you can see, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, put all of this in a small grind, spice grinder. So I really just cut those maybe into quarters, not even, maybe into halves. It depends on what you're gonna use, and we'll talk about that. I also used some ginger. I would use about an, a thumb, a, half of your thumbs worth, an inch worth, if you will. This is about half of this. I peeled this and then I kind of diced it just a little bit so that it would be easier to get it all to process together. Um, because I didn't have the, the, the most fantastic of things like that devices. Um, I used um, about one and a half, this is a shallot, you can see. It's like a red onion. If you don't use shallots, you can use red onion. But I particularly like these, they're sweet, shallots are sweet, they're mellow, they're not really strong onion, um, and they're quite nice in this. And actually we're gonna use the moisture from this, believe it or not, to help us get this into paste. So usually I think of my recipe, I say two tablespoons diced. Um, I would probably, by the time you cut the end off of these, I might use another half of this tiny, kind of tiny one. Um, just to mention about shallots, if you like onions, uh, whole shallots in a stew, um, I cannot recommend that highly enough. Uh, they're fantastic. They'll fall apart and they'll be not too oniony, just lovely. So I have that, I have the ginger. The other thing that I'm going to add are going to be curry leaves. So I've got, to, I've got to say a funny thing about these curry leaves, if you can see them. These are very nice green, I would call them fresh. Uh, or curry leaves, kefir lime leaves. Sorry about that, I was thinking curry leaves. Um, these actually grow on the tree and they're harvested. They have a great, great lime flavor. Now, um, you can get these dried and most often people do get them dried. Um, it just so happens, I got very excited. I ordered these kefir lime leaves a few weeks ago and thought I need curry paste. And lo and behold, my lovely order, 
came with the fresh ones. So um, where I live, that seems to be the thing that we get delivered. I'm very excited about that. Uh, I am in a small, by the way, very small rural northern Scottish village. So these are the things that get you excited. Um, and I used um, two of these, I think, in here. I might even be inclined to use three. They're really nice. I would just kind of chop them up a little bit, just enough so that when you start to blend it all together, it's easier to get it mixed. And then I also used lemongrass. Now, if you're not familiar with lemongrass, have a look at that. It looks uh, right here, uh, the way I'm looking at myself, it looks like a, like a scallion or a, what you would call spring onion. It isn't. Um, if you've never used lemongrass, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful kind of an herb. Um, it's very, very hard. And when you want to cut it, you'll kind of look, let me take the peel off of this a little bit. You will want to peel it. But what I want to point out is you can kind of see it's got this big bowl. You don't want to use that. So for this one, I would probably use, I would have probably cut it like this, just to use a little bit of that, just to use a little bit of the top. And then you want to slice it. They are very, very tough. I don't know, maybe people chew on those, I don't know. Um, but I'm gonna use two of those. I'm gonna slice, or I trimmed the outer skin when I went to show you this. So I trimmed the outer skin of this one as well. And I kind of sliced this one up. Then I added a couple of red chilies. Um, these are not jalapeno. Um, and hey, I'm a, I'm a new person in a new country. So normally I would get a nice uh, long lock Thai chili, this is what I can get. They're a kind of a mild chili, which makes me very happy. If you are a chili averse person, but you want the flavor, one thing to know is that when you open this chili, so let me, let me give it an open. And let's make sure this one's got, oh, this, is, this one's a very clean one. Um, and you see inside this chili, it's kind of got, you've got the seeds and you've got this white bit the white bit is very, very hot. So if you're trying to clean chilies out, one of the things, get the seeds out and get the white bits out, get that, get that out. That will really help to control the heat. I've also advised people who don't want that much heat to just take a small slice or about a quarter of a red bell pepper or one of the longer red peppers. Just take a, take a piece of that, use that in place of these fresh chilies. You don't, you don't have to go crazy. You don't have to be myself and my husband who like things super hot. Uh, and then I use some um, cilantro. Uh, I'm going to be bilingual. We call this coriander as well. Um, I, I actually believe that coriander is the entire plant stems as well. And cilantro is the leaves. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, please do. Um, I use the tender stems as well. Before I put this in my paste, one thing to know about it, uh, if you, just take it, take a bowl of water and just, just hold that and just swish it around. That's a lot better than taking an herb like this. It's kind of a delicate herb and just blasting it under the faucet to get it, to get it cleaned off. Um, that will really help your, your um, cilantro as well. Um, and if you have one of those cilantro adverse people in your life, um, you can leave this out. You could also use a Thai basil, um, I'm not inclined to do that. It's difficult for me to find. It's very expensive as well. Final ingredient here. I, I'm almost embarrassed to show you this. This is my 90,000 year old grater. <laughs> but what I actually did was I just took and I grated lime zest. That's what I did. Um, and I added about two tablespoons. Now that is honestly with the lime that's about this size. It's not bad size lime. That's about three. Um, one thing about citrus that I want to bring up, if you are using the zest of um, limes, uh, lemons, oranges, if you're actually using the zest of those things, try if you can to be sure you stick to organic um, because you're using the peel in cooking and you're eating that. It's kind of important. I, I don't do a lot of organic, but this is one of the places that I really try to be diligent. Right. So. Um, let's talk about what happened. I toasted all these um, spices up just very quickly. Now, you can do a couple things here. If you want a good workout, take a pestle and mortar, put those herbs in, grind up all the dry herbs. 
if you want a little easier way, I, I'll tell you what I made this in. I have this great little um, spice grinder guy. Um, it just looks like this. It goes on the uh, my wash food processor back there. And what I did is I started layering things in. I started with the dry spices. I ground them, ground them, ground them, right? And then I started adding other things in. So little bits of the shallots and then the red pepper, uh, red chilies, ginger. And I got everything in there and I blended it up. Um, and it took a little bit of time. The other thing that I sometimes use, I have one that goes with my immersion blender. That's just a little spice grinder like that. That works as well, uh, depending what you have. Um, I have tried it this way. It, if you're feeling anxious or angry, this is a lifesaver here to make you happy. Um, and that is what I did. And I ended up with a really great curry paste. I'll probably use a couple tablespoons of this. And now very quickly, because I know I'm really talking for not cooking today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how I use this. So um, I think we already had a little discussion about coconut milk, and I agree. So one of the things when I make a Thai curry, I really just dig on putting in a whole load of vegetables, maybe four, five, six cups, whatever, of whatever it is, uh, sliced vegetables. I love the tender stem, broccoli, all of those things. And I just kind of stir fry those up. And then I want to add some sort of a sauce with it. And a lot of times what we always do with curry, oftentimes a Thai curry, it's the good old coconut milk. And this is a lighter coconut milk. And here's the problem with it. Yes, it's got loads. Even the light stuff has got loads of saturated fat and calories. And I've been really kind of being diligent about and mindful about kind of the hidden fat calories that you get when you, it's plant-based, it's vegan, it's all those things, it's great for you. And if you use it, no condemnation from me, but I decided to try out some easier ways. So one of the things I do is rather than use a can, I use a cup and a half of plant milk. Usually I have oat milk. Then I have this handy dandy little bottle of natural flavored coconut extract. And I put a couple, a uh, few drops of that in there. If I'm feeling really, really excited about coconut, maybe more, but guess what? I've cut all the fat from having that coconut milk. And Honestly, you will not taste the difference because you've got so much flavor going on from that curry paste, which by the way, is the, our, my entire kitchen smells just like bright and fresh and flashy. So that is one thing you can do. Another thing, uh, if you're making that kind of veggie curry, the only other thing I'd probably add might be a couple of teaspoons of tabari, a little soy sauce kind of thing. There's no salt in this paste. I never put salt in things until I get to the end. And that's the end of that. Um, the other thing you can do is take a few mangoes, blend a few mangoes, add a couple tablespoons of this curry paste, add in again your coconut milk or your plant milk with your coconut extract, and guess what you have? A fantastic mango curry sauce. And so I think I've done enough talking because I feel like I've been talking a long time. Um, and I just wanna say, I think we're knocking it over to the United States and I think it is Carolyn, am I right? Montgomery, Alabama. Thanks, everybody. Just mad about saffron. Saffron's mad about me. I'm just mad about saffron. And you will be too if you try this fabulous paella I'm making today with saffron. So we are. I've already started in an effort to save a little bit of time because saffron takes a little while. So one of the things that we do first is cook some saffron rice. And so I've been using this delicious paella rice. Um, I found this at Whole Foods. You can also find what's called, um, uh, I think paella rice, but also Spanish rice, um, just short grain rice. You could probably use just about any short grain rice. So um, we've done that. So I have 16 ounces, which comes out to be about two and a half cups, but you might want to measure it and check. And I've already cooked that with two uh, cups of wine and four cups of 
vegetable broth. And I've used a low sodium vegetable broth. You could also make your own vegetable broth homemade. You could use better than bouillon. And to make it lower sodium, just don't put as much of the bouillon paste in as it calls for and you'll decrease your sodium. So four cups of broth, two cups of wine. If you see the recipe, you'll say it says six cups of broth. And that's because we're saving some of the broth aside. So I have also already started cooking, as you can see in my lovely little paella pan here, started cooking some onions and some red pepper. And I have just sauteed them in only broth. This is some of that extra broth that you need for cooking your peppers and onions. So while those are cooking a little bit more, let's talk about saffron. So this is a saffron that I found at Whole Foods. I noticed the other day, unfortunately, it appears that it is going to be out of stock pretty soon. It has one of those little asterisks in the corner, which I've heard means the asterisk of death. And so it's not gonna be there much longer. Um, so if you wanna get it from um, Whole Foods, grab it there. Um, I also, and this was actually from Spain. So I also have a saffron from Iran, a Persian saffron. And you look at the saffron to tell about high quality, how high quality it is. Um, very deep red, and that's what you really want. And it smells incredible. So let's talk about what saffron is. Saffron is the most expensive spice on the planet. It actually costs more than gold. So Luckily, you don't need much of it. You're gonna use just a little pinch of it every time you cook with it. So saffron actually comes from the flower, the crocus sativus. And it's a beautiful purple flower that only blooms in the fall. And if you know what flowers look like, if you think about tulips or crocus flowers, when they're blooming, they have these beautiful little stigma that stick up from them, the little threads that stick out of the middle of the, of the flower. And that is saffron. Those are saffron threads. Um, so now that the peppers and onions have cooked pretty well, I am adding eight ounces of shiitake mushrooms. You could also add baby bella mushrooms. If you're not a mushroom fan, you could probably just leave it out. So I didn't used to be a mushroom fan. And I know my mother is watching this and laughing at me because I <laughs> really didn't eat. I would I refused to eat mushrooms growing up. I thought they were gross. But now I you know what? They're really good for you. And the shiitake mushrooms add a really nice texture and flavor. And while this is cooking, add a little more of the broth. So you notice I haven't used any oil, as some of my previous instructors have said. We don't use a lot of oil when cooking with food for life because we know it's not adding any nutrients and it adds a lot of fat and calories. So the reason that saffron is so very, very expensive is because, like I said, those crocus sativus flowers only bloom one week out of a year, one week a year in the fall. And every one of those little stigma or saffron threads has to be harvested by hand. And every crocus flower only has three. So it takes a thousand flowers to make one ounce. It takes 75,000 flowers to make a pound. So <laughs> now you know why it's so expensive. So, but it's so very worth it because you need just a teeny tiny pinch. So when using saffron, the best way to get the most bang for your buck, and really it is getting bang for your buck because it's a lot of bucks, is you take a pinch of that saffron and then just pour a little bit of hot water, a couple tablespoons over it. And as you can see, it's made the water very orange. And that's what we want. It's making those saffron threads bloom and it's getting the flavor out of them into that water. And we're gonna use that water in just a minute. So we're letting it just sit aside Okay, and it's, oh, these mushrooms are starting to get nice and cooked through. So the reason to eat saffron, other than the fact that it is absolutely delicious, is it's actually really good for you. Saffron contains powerful antioxidants, and as we know, antioxidants fight free radicals, 
and free radicals are what lead to cancer development and growth in our bodies. And so we want to eat foods that are high in antioxidants. So saffron happens to have lots of antioxidants and it tastes fabulous. So lots of reasons right there. But some recent studies have actually shown that eating saffron or incorporating saffron into your diet or even taking saffron and putting a few pinches in your tea and drinking it every day can decrease the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease as much as taking the commercial drug Aricept. There was a study about that recently. And that may not be saying much because Aricept doesn't necessarily work all that well. But um, once you have Alzheimer's, it is pretty hard to you know, decrease the symptoms of Alzheimer's, unfortunately. So prevention is really the key there. Um, but the other things that look really promising with saffron are helping with mood. And so there've been studies with depression and saffron and the use of saffron um, every day as a tea or adding it to your food, taking a saffron supplement, that kind of thing. I wouldn't recommend using a supplement. I would just add it right to my food or you can make a nice tea out of it. Soak it in some hot water, leave the saffron threads in and add a little sweetener if you want to and just drink it. It's actually really, really good for you. But it has been shown in studies to decrease the feelings of depression in people with major depressive disorder. Um, and another area where it's very promising is in premenstrual syndrome and in menstrual pain. So women who, I found this, this study really fascinating, women who just sniffed saffron, just smelled it several times a day, mm, actually decreased their anxiety and headaches and a lot of other symptoms that are noted with severe premenstrual syndrome. So, you know, oh, and actually in some cultures, and this has been going on for thousands of years, people have used it as a cure for baldness. I'm not really sure that works from what I understand. They just make a paste of it and spread it on their heads. I would rather eat it. So because it tastes really good. So do that instead. All right, so now that the onions and the peppers and the mushrooms have really started cooking down and they smell so good and too bad we don't have smell of vision we are going to add the green peas. And I have a few pieces of asparagus stem that were just a little too long for the topping. So we're throwing in some asparagus stem. I have already steamed some asparagus on side of the side. So we can put that on top as soon as we're ready to put the whole thing in the oven. So I added some peas, and then I'm going to add some piquillo peppers. Piquillo peppers are very similar to roasted red peppers. They just have a little bit of a sweeter, more distinctive flavor, and they are very traditional in Spanish paella. And so you can find piquillo peppers at well-stocked grocery stores, probably on Amazon. Um, so we're stirring those in and they are just beautiful and fragrant. This is a very colorful dish. All right, and then we're gonna add a couple of cloves of minced garlic. Almost went all over the counter there. All right, a couple of cloves of minced garlic and some capers. So I have two tablespoons of organic capers which I really like capers. So I have a very big jar of capers. So we're gonna add a couple of tablespoons of capers. And then you want a few, maybe another tablespoon or so extra um, to sprinkle on the top when you're done because it's, they're very pretty. All right, that's just looking so beautiful and colorful and smells incredible. And now we're adding a teaspoon of smoked paprika and a half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. If you like really spicy food, you could add a whole teaspoon of cayenne pepper if you want to. You could also decrease it. If you are not into really spicy food, then decrease it, that's fine too. I encourage you to play with your food. All right, so we have that. Oh, that just smells so good. All right, and then we are adding, we're gonna just let this cook for a little bit, let all those flavors marry. And then here comes the fun part. Okay, so I've already cooked that short grain paella rice or Spanish rice. And we're gonna get to see how that saffron turns the rice orange, yellowy orange, in just a second. All right, so I've already cooked all this rice. We're just gonna dump it in. If it'll dump out, 
stuck in there. There we go. And I'm using a 13 inch paella pan, which is really about right for a family of four, I would think, or for two hungry people who like leftovers, which would be the case in my house since I'm an empty nester now, so. Okay, and then we're gonna take that saffron water that we made. So it has the threads still in it, don't get rid of them. Just add them right in. So we're dumping it over the top and you want all of that delicious. I mean, remember it's expensive, right? So we wanna put, we wanna get all of it out. So I just put a little rice in my bowl and just make sure we scrape all of it out. Get every last drop of that delicious saffron yumminess. And I'm gonna go ahead and just turn off the heat because it's going to go in the oven. So traditional Spanish paella has, I'm gonna add a little more broth to it too. So traditional Spanish paella has seafood in it. Usually um, you'll find things like shrimp or clams or whatever. So we're not doing that because we are eating whole food plant-based. We're avoiding all that saturated fat and cholesterol. You can see how beautiful orangey yellow this is now from the saffron and the smell is just incredible. So once we get this all stirred up, ooh, got really thick on me. Okay, and if you make this at home and you find that the rice doesn't fully soak up all the liquid when you put it in the pan, that's perfectly fine because we're putting it in the oven anyway for about half an hour at 375 and you'll probably end up having to add more liquid to it as it sits in the oven. So, okay, get that all mashed down. And then before it goes in the oven, we're going to lay some asparagus spears across the top in a nice pattern and some artichoke hearts that have been cut in half already. So I just used canned artichoke hearts. You could use fresh if you wanna to go to all the trouble of getting all those outside peels off. That's pretty hard to do, but canned is fine too. Um, and then rinse them off, get the sodium off of them if there's a lot of salt in your artichokes. Okay, so when it comes out, it will look like this. And this is a 15 inch paella pan that my neighbor very nicely let me borrow. You can find paella pans as big as like three feet across. If you go to a traditional Spanish restaurant or you visit Spain, you may find paella pans that are just enormous. So, but this is absolutely delicious. It smells fabulous. And we'll put a little bit of maybe some chopped olives on top. Um, Castle Veltrano are fabulous. So you can put a little bit of sliced olive and a little bit of extra caper and then slice up some lime or lemon wedges and just squeeze it over the top. It's excellent. You won't miss the seafood and really delicious. And one of the typical things that you find in a traditional Spanish paella is that the crust on the bottom has gotten very crispy. Well, that's typically because of oil and I didn't use any oil. So I still ended up with a crispy crust because we put it in the oven and we put it low in the oven. So you wanna just take, you could take out the top few shelves if you want to put it in the bottom third of your oven and the heat will really focus nice and low in the pan and actually crisp up that rice. So, and the longer it sits here, it's not gonna get crispy. I can put it back in the oven and reheat it. It'll get crispy again on the bottom, but it will do that without oil if you put it down low in the oven. So um, I hope you'll give paella a try. It has become one of our favorite things to eat around here. I brought it to a potluck the other day and it, it just was gone. So <laughs> everybody loved it. An outdoor socially distanced potluck, by the way. But, um, and I am going to send you over to, and before I do, remember to add any questions you have in the comment section at the bottom and let us know where you're from too. I think it's very interesting to find out where everybody's watching from because we're all over the place. We're, you know, we're in other countries. We're here in the United States. We'd love to know where you're from. So go ahead and add that in your comments as well. And I'm gonna send you over to Debbie just down the road in Lakeland, Florida. 
Thank you, Carolyn. And your paella looks absolutely fabulous. That is a traditional dish over in Tampa, which is just down the road from me. And we truly enjoy eating that. Well, I do live in Central Florida between Orlando and Tampa, but my roots are from New Orleans. And today I'm going to be talking about Creole and Cajun seasoning. And in the meantime, I'm going to be preparing a traditional Creole sauce. Now to speed up things, I started the sauce because um, you may have heard the terminology, the Trinity. And the Trinity consists of onions, bell pepper, and whoops, and celery. And so that is truly the basis of so many Louisiana dishes, the, the onion, bell pepper, and celery. Now I like to use orange, yellow, and red peppers because they don't have quite the propensity to cause gastric reflux. For me, um, green peppers do cause that issue. So what I did, I have my celery, my peppers, and my onions in um, vegetable broth. And I'll tell you, I use the kitchen basics because there's no um, added oil to it. And there is also very little sodium added to this. You probably have heard already from all of us. And if you have tuned in before, we really watch the intake of oil because of the calorie content. And we also like to watch sodium. Okay, so I started with the vegetable broth, about a half a cup, and I added my onions, my peppers, and my celery, and it has been cooking. So the next thing I'm going to add to this Creole sauce, and as I said, Creole sauce is something that is very traditional in Louisiana, and I am adding that to our mix. Also to this is um, garlic, but in my garlic, I like to add um, parsley because I use parsley in everything, basil and also oregano. So all of that is fresh and I'm just going to mix that in. Then our typical Creole seasonings, they are, um, we have uh, cayenne pepper in here. We have onion powder. Um, black pepper, also white pepper. So the black and the white pepper have different effects, just like the red pepper. And I will tell you that white pepper is very um, strong. So be careful if you don't like a lot of it, um, please be careful. Now I have grown up with Paul Prudhomme and Justin Wilson, and they both, and those are two Cajun um, and I say Cajun because they're down south, Louisiana, but those are two Cajun chefs and uh, they both use a lot of white, red, and black pepper. The very first time I had a, my parents and my in-laws over, I made them an etouffee and I will tell you there is so much white pepper, my lips just seem to fry. So just be cautious, I'm just giving you that warning. Okay, so I added all of that. The next thing I am going to add is going to be um, some tomato sauce. And that's going to complete this Creole sauce. And next I'm going to put it back on the stove and get this cooking while I explain to you all of the different sauces or all of the different seasonings. So let me give this a stir and the aroma is just incredible. And as you see, all of these colors are coming out. Now, just like Carolyn's paella, there is a, a um, Cajun or a Creole recipe that's called jambalaya. And it too is a rice dish. It also has saffron in it. It's probably very similar to the paella. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna put this back on and we're going to cook that. And let's talk about seasonings and where they 
have originated from. So we have Creole and we have Cajun, and both of those are Louis, Louisiana-based seasonings. Cajun began in Southern France. It moved into Nova Scotia, and then it came to Louisiana. Now, many Cajun ingredients grew wild and were quite plentiful because the, the Cajuns really are in the deep south Louisiana, and they're not necessarily, I'm not going to say they're poor, but I would say that they are very rustic. Now, their seasonings are going to be fewer. Once again, they're going to involve the trinity, the onion, the bell pepper, and the celery, but, and they also would probably add the tomatoes, uh, but that really is going to be the basis of it. We have um, some other things that may be included in that dried oregano and paprika, and of course your peppers, um, just like I said, the white pepper, the red pepper, and the black pepper. So that's going to be more Cajun. Now, Creole really originated, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, the Creole originated in New Orleans itself. And it really was um, an evolvement. It evolved every time there was a change of governments and there was somebody new at the helm, then the flavor kind of changed. So it was a mixture of the French culture, the Spanish, Italian, American Indian, African. And then once again, if there was another person in control, then there was more of a, that flavor kind of um, melted with everything else. So Creole, as I said, comes from New Orleans. So it's going to be more sophisticated and it's called city cooking. Okay, now some of the seasonings that are very specific to Creole, um, once again, are Trinity. They're going to have paprika, garlic powder, salt, and they do go heavy on the salt. So you have to watch that. Uh, remember, we are trying to restrict our salt because we don't need that. And salt leads to high blood pressure and so many other things um, that can, in other conditions can be complicated due to too much salt. We have onion powder in there, oregano, thyme, cayenne pepper once again, um, the black and the white pepper. So let's look back here and see how our, can you zoom in on this? Um, look how our dish is doing and it is cooking up nicely. Um, this Creole sauce can be used um, in multiple ways. Um, I am going to use it um, on, as a topping over my beans and rice, but I will tell you that um, it can be used on the top of a jambalaya. So just like, um, and I'm going, because I don't have a jambalaya, um, I'm going to refer to the paella that um, Carolyn made because that is uh, what jambalaya typically looks like. It is a combination of so many things. True, most of them are full of um, some fish, some shrimp, oysters, and so forth. However, those um, we are doing whole food plant-based, so our um, plant-based recipes would only include the vegetables. So. This will be done in just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add it to my bean mixture. So I have my barley on the base and I actually made what is classified as a dirty rice, but I used barley instead. And your typical dirty rice would actually have andouille sausage in it and it may have another sausage in it. But I like to add um, my trinity to it. And um, beyond the trinity, I um, may add some lentils to it also to make my dirty rice. And then I have a black bean and actually it's about a three bean mixture, but black beans is the main mixture here. So, oh, you know what? I forgot um, to add my dry seasoning. 
gosh, forgive me. So here are my dry seasoning. I have bay leaf and bay leaf is very, very common. Um, they have a lot of bay trees out in Louisiana. And then my dry ingredients. So let me put those in. And usually my bay leaves would go in first. So let me flip that. And once again, the aroma is very, very intense. Okay. And I want to turn that down just a little bit. Um, I think I went over all of the different ingredients with you, the thyme and the bay leaf. Um, I'm actually using a Turkish bay leaf today. Another thing I wanted to um, mention to you is hot sauce. Louisiana hot sauce is very, very common. Um, it is on most New Orleans tables, just as, as salt and pepper would be there, the hot sauce would be there. They like things hot over in Louisiana. And, um, so I am going to turn this off and I'm going to show you how you would use this. So basically, um, look how beautiful this is. And you would just pop this and that would make just a great topping for almost anything. Because think of all of the nutrients that you have in here beyond the, the peppers, the tomatoes, the onions, and the celery, but you've got all of your spices. Um, you have your beans. You also have your barley here, and it just makes for a great evening meal. So um, I hope if you have any questions that you'll put those in the Facebook chat. I hope you will find me on fitofit.life. And now I am going to send you to my friend Angelita, and she's in Greensville, South Carolina. So take it away, Angelita. Hey, Debbie, thank you so much. That looked absolutely delicious. I am definitely going to try that this weekend. Hi, my name is Angelita Alvarez Hughes, and I will be making a Mexican cooking sauce. Today, there's two ways of making it. You can make it really spicy or you can make it very savory. I sent a revised recipe um, over for the spicy one. And I already pre-cooked this because it does take a little while. So um, what you'll be using is the Guajillo chili or the Guajillo pepper, which is the second most used pepper in uh, Mexican cooking, it's smoky, it's very savory, it colors the food beautifully. If you've ever had tamales or pozole, um, then this was definitely in there. Um, and then also, we'll be using chile de árbol, and that's this little pepper right here, also known as uh, bird's beak or rat tail chili. Uh, this right here is very spicy. Uh, well, I'm also, um, I don't tolerate heat a lot, so I only use four of these, but uh, feel free to use as many as you want, depending on how much you can handle the heat. And what we do is you take the seeds out of the pod and um, all you do is, I believe earlier they showed you uh, how to do this as well. So you just shake all the seeds out and then in a very uh, heavy cast iron pan that's on high heat, you're gonna toast them. You're only gonna toast them for probably a minute to two minutes when they're toasted, along with the chile de arbol at the same time, you're gonna put it in a container and pour boiling water over it and let it sit for about 15 minutes so it can reconstitute, save the liquid. And you're going to use, let's see, where's my recipe? Okay, so we need 
two cups of tomatoes. Um, in Mexican cooking, the Roma tomato is what we use a lot, uh, but feel free to use any tomato that you want. Just know that depending on the tomato, sometimes it'll make the sauce a little bit sweet. So we always use these. And depending on the color of the tomato is gonna give you the color of your sauce. I buy my tomatoes in two different um, colors. I buy the red that I'm gonna use immediately and then I buy them kind of orange or breaker. Breaker means they're kind of green with a little bit of orange and then they will ripen as you leave them on the counter. Don't put them in your refrigerator. Um, so then that way, especially if they're on sale, I'm very frugal, um, you know, buy them that way, they'll last you a lot longer. And you're gonna use garlic and cumin and you're gonna use coriander. Now, the good thing about this way of cooking is sometimes you have to substitute. So I was in a hurry yesterday, I forgot to buy the cilantro, um, but luckily I have the coriander seeds. And so what I do is I toast them and then I grind them. And this is what you get is a powder. So for the recipe calls for one cup of cilantro, a fresh cilantro, I use one tablespoon of the ground coriander seed in the sauce. Once 15 minutes have passed, you're gonna take the, the chilies, they'll be soft and pliable. You're gonna put them in your blender along with the tomatoes and the onion and the garlic and all the spices. And you're gonna blend it until it's smooth. Then you're gonna pour it into a pot and you're gonna cook it on medium heat until it is half of what was in there originally. And this is usually, yeah, I like to pour it in a bottle like this. What I do with that is you can add, um, you can add it to rice that you've already cooked. You can add it to pinto beans. You can add it to black beans. You can add it to any kind of beans that you like. If you make your own hummus, you can add that to your hummus and then you can take that hummus and mix it into some pasta or you can put that over a baked potato. There's so many things that you can do. If you make veggie patties, you can take a teaspoon of this Mexican salsa and put it over the veggie patty and just bake it a little bit longer and you'll, it'll give it a different flavor. Uh, you can add it to your tofu scramble. There, if you make savory waffles, you can add it to the mix and you can make a savory waffle, you can add it to polenta. I didn't prepare anything um, to show you how to do it because there's so many things that you can add it to. Um, I made my own hummus and I added that uh, to my hummus. It's absolutely wonderful. If you make your own vegan cheese sauce, you can take a couple of tablespoons up to a quarter of the salsa and mix it with your cheese sauce, and then you can pour that over your nachos. Uh, you can put it in your tacos, uh, your enchiladas. Um, you can mix it with vegan mayo as well. And you can also mix it in with uh, vegan um, sour cream. Oh my gosh, there's just so many things that you can do. Um, but anyway, this is just a quick little lesson um that i wanted to show everyone and then also with the ingredients that is on my recipe to make this cooking salsa if you don't cook it down and you just leave it the way it comes out of your blender um that makes a wonderful dipping sauce and then also you can take corn tortillas and run it through that sauce and then fill it with vegetables roll it up put it in a casserole dish add your cheese sauce to the top of it bake it and you've made wonderful savory enchiladas. But um, I just want to share that with you guys. I know it's very quick. It's very easy to me. Uh, you can go onto my website at www.earthseedsandwater.com. I will have the recipe there along with some um, suggestions on how to use it. Uh, I'm on Facebook as well at earthseed.water.com slash my journey to plant based. And I'm also on Instagram, uh, all lower caps, earthseeds and water uh, underscore. And 
Uh, now we're going to pass it on to Ella Rodriguez, who will be making ceviche. On to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ella Rodriguez, and I'm coming to you from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I actually grew up in Europe, in Romania, and um, I immigrated in the United States. And I actually, the palates that I used to have in Romania was very bland. So not a lot of spices and seasonings. So when I started transitioning to plant-based eating um, while in the United States, that's when I really fell in love with the Indian cuisine and the Thai recipes and especially, especially the um, Latin kind of um, cuisine. So the recipe that I'm going to show you guys today is ceviche. Um, it originally started in Peru from my year and they used to use um, raw fish and they just cooked the raw fish in lime juice and just the acidity of um, the fruits that I mixed it with. Um, so today, instead of the fish, we're going to use heart of palm. Now the heart of palm are basically, it's a vegetable, it's just the inner part of uh, a certain kind of palm tree. And when you buy a can, uh, it comes in different forms. So you can buy it sliced, or you can buy it just in like tubular forms that looks like this, and then you slice it yourself. So it all depends on how you find it. So um, over here, I have the ones that were already sliced, and this is how it comes, if it comes in a total place. And this is a great snack. It doesn't really have a flavor, so it just really um, takes on the flavors that you put it with. So I'm just going to add two cans of that, and I'm just gonna slice the last over with them. And then to this, I'm going to add some chopped tomatoes. Now, this recipe doesn't really have the dry um, seasonings that you guys saw all day today. It's more about the flavor combination um, and the mixture, and that's where the, the flavor comes from, not necessarily from the dry seasonings. So I'm going to add some chopped tomatoes, about three, four um, medium chopped tomatoes, and you can use um, any, any kind of tomatoes you want um, in this. And to that, we're going to add some red pepper, red bell pepper, yellow red pepper, you can add that as well. Um, so we're just looking for nice, beautiful colors. And uh, this is a great source of vitamin C. So we're going to add that. Um, we're going to go with some red onions. Um, this is great for uh, antioxidants and cancer fighting properties. And let's see. Next, I'm going to add some cilantro. You heard about cilantro today. Some people love it. I'm one of those people. My family loves it. My husband is Dominican, he loves it. But some people really don't like it. Um, it kind of tastes like soap to them. So it really, you know, depends if you love cilantro or not. Um, and then to this, the cilantro combination with um, lemon juice or lime juice, um, it's really, really yummy. So I'm just going to add some lemon juice. You can use definitely lime juice for a stronger flavor over here, but this is what I had on hand today. So that's what I'm using. Okay, and the cedar is going to make that juice for all the flavors to combine together. And to give it that, um, you know, fishy taste uh, for those people who are just transitioning to a plant base if they're still looking for that. Um, you can use seaweed. So what I have over here is just some nori um, sheets and I just took one of them and just crumbled it up. So I'm going to put it over there. Um, I, I'm not necessarily going for the fishy taste. I'm really just going for the iodine. Um, so seaweed is a great source of iodine, which is what we need. Um, for our thyroid to, to work the right way. And the I'm going to use some salt. And again, when we're using um, so, salt, we're looking for the one with the umbrella and that's the salt that has the iodine added to it. So that's the best salt to have, not necessarily all the sea salt and the you know Himalayan salt and all these other salts. So just a little bit because if we have the lemon juice, and a lot of times taste buds in our mouth that the salt and the lemon goes to is similar. So if you have that, you might not really need so much salt. So it's up to you. Um, and if you are not somebody who's concerned about weight loss, highly recommend to add some avocado to it. So I'm just going to scoop up a little bit of avocado. Um, 
nice and fresh and the, the combination of those flavors is just really, really good. So we're adding a little bit of healthy fat, but if we're worrying about weight loss, then you know you can totally skip this. Um, and you don't have to use the avocado part. And this recipe is really versatile. So, you know, if you want to add some uh, cucumbers, diced cucumbers, you can do that as well. Uh, you know, different kind of peppers. So you can really play with it. It doesn't have to be just like it is now. But we're keeping it simple for now. And then, you know, if uh, you like a little bit of uh, a kick into your food, you can add a dash of cayenne pepper. But I'm making this for my children and they don't really enjoy. Um, heat much. So this is it. We're just going to enjoy this as is as a salad, uh, or you can serve it on top of some rice or, you know, all the kind of grains, or even with some uh, baked corn chips or something like that. And you can serve it right away. But it actually um, tastes better when you marinate it for an hour or so, so that all the flavor kind of mix in together. So um, that's all I have for you today. I hope you're going to try it. Uh, let me show you how it looks like. Lots of beautiful colors. Um, so yes, give it a try. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Cody in Omaha, Nebraska. Take it away, Cody. Hi everybody, thank you Ella. It's great to see you today. That looks delicious and I can't wait to try it. So um, I got a couple guests with me. I got my youngest daughter, Nora, can you say hi? And I got my middle daughter, Ella. And they're on the So Many Kids in the Kitchen. So we have a show next week, but these two lovely little gal gals are gonna join me today just to help out and be my taste testers. So, um, so welcome to Omaha, Nebraska. So I am Cody Stubbe and I'm a registered nurse and I'm a Food for Life instructor. And I am so excited about this recipe. This is a new one that I developed recently. And it's, it's one of our family favorites, right girls? Yeah, it's called breakfast bake. Breakfast bake is what we call it. Um, the title of it's apple pecan oat bake. It's very versatile, which is fun. Um, can you sit still first? Perfect, all right. Um, so we're also going to talk about cinnamon. Cinnamon is one of our favorite spices. We use it a lot. Um, I grew up with cinnamon and cinnamon rolls and apple pies. And so it, it's one of these great spices that can be used in sweet recipes or savory. Uh, you can look at it, hold it. Um, <laughs> there's different types of cinnamon. Um, so cinnamon is one of those ancient spices. And so it's been around forever and I wouldn't need it. Not, it might be kind of hard on your teeth. <laughs> oh, she's, she's pretty curious about it. Um, we don't normally buy this, but this is what cinnamon looks like. It comes from the bark of a cinnamon tree and the, the tree can grow up to 60 feet tall. So pretty big. And they harvest the bark and then you can grind it down and you make your cinnamon, um, like uh, just the ground cinnamon up, up and it's easy to use in recipes. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Is it? Okay. <laughs> sure. It's a little bit spicy. Okay. It's, it's wood, it's bark. Yeah. So just a tiny little bit. Okay. It's gonna be really kind of hard to chew. That's why we grind it down. Um, but, you know, as kids, they're curious and they want to try everything and that's okay. Cinnamon is a safe um, spice for them to try. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, there's so there's two main classes of cinnamon. So there's the salon, which is um, it's less common in the U.S. and it's more expensive. So you usually don't see it sold around here. The, the more common or the traditional is the cassia cinnamon. And so there's two types, like I said, there's the traditional one, which is what I have here and here. And so that's me like you're less expensive. And then there's a more expensive one called the Saigon cinnamon, or it's also called the um, Vietnamese cinnamon. And that has a stronger flavor. And that's due to the, the cinnamaldehyde that is in it. There's just a more amount of that in there. So it gives it that more robust flavor. 
And it also has more powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. So um, that Saigon cinnamon is going to be a little more expensive, possibly. Um, I haven't bought it yet. I haven't seen it for sale. It's something I'll probably have to purchase online, but I'm definitely intrigued to try it. So we generally use the traditional around here. And it looks like my little girls are just enjoying the cinnamon bark. <laughs> oh, it's cracked me up. So anyway, I'm glad that they joined me. So cinnamon is also, it's full of fiber, as you can see, it's, it's made from the bark. So of course, lots of fiber, there's calcium, there's vitamin K, vitamin E, there's zinc, there's magnesium in it. Um, and like I said, there's powerful antioxidants. So it can actually aid in um, uh, leveling out blood sugar levels, which is wonderful. They must be having to go get a drink of water. <laughs> um, so like I said, it can be used in sweet and savory dishes. Um, we like to use it in smoothies. It's really good. So if you haven't tried it in smoothies, you should definitely try it. Um, you can also use it in tea. And we also, one of our favorite things every morning, I like to put a little bit in with my coffee grinds when we're making coffee and it just gives it that nice flavor. So that's one of these, these tips that I suggest that you try if, if you do like the flavor of cinnamon. So today, like I said, we're gonna make this fun. It's easy. The girls usually like to help me make it. It's the apple pecan oat bake. And like I said, this is something that's very versatile. So if you don't have pecans, you can use walnuts. If you don't have apples, you can use other things, other kinds of fruit. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with about three cups of old fashioned oats. And I have those right here. And then we're going to add in a few ingredients. We're going to add two tablespoons of ground flax seed. So as you guys know, flax seed has those healthy omega-3 um, for you, so it's anti-inflammatory. You wanna dump that in for me? Mm -hmm. That would be fabulous, thank you. Okay, and then we're gonna do, are you gonna help me stir too? Yeah. Okay, this is one fourth a cup oat flour. Go ahead and dump that in. Good job. I'm so glad I have help. Do you wanna dump in the cinnamon for me? Yeah. Okay, we got two teaspoons of ground, the traditional cinnamon. Perfect, thanks. Do you wanna start mixing that up for me? Oh, I'm so glad I have my helpers. You can help me in just a minute. All right. So next we're going to add in one cup. Oh, I will when we're done. Okay. Thank you. We're going to add in one cup of chopped pecans. Mm -hmm. Do you want to help me? Great job, Nora. Okay. And then what do we have here? Do you remember how many? Two. Right. Two cups. Nope. Just two apples. And you can chop them up as little as you want, but bite-sized works well. Great job, Ella. All right, so before I would get this mixed up, what you can do is get your dates ready. So what you do is you take eight dates and you make sure that they're pitted. And then I put them in like a glass container with one and a half cups of filtered water and I put it in the microwave um, for about a minute and a half. And if you don't have a microwave, just um, hot water. You can even use a little bit of boiling water instead. And you're gonna let them soak. And it probably just needs maybe about five minutes to soak. It's just gonna soften them up. And what we're gonna do with that is we're gonna take these softened dates and we're going to put it in like this hand mixer. Or it's kind of like a little silver bullet hand mixer for smoothies, individual smoothies. But it works great for this dish. So I'm just going to kind of fish those out here. You like dates, don't you? I like to Yeah, I'm going to add some of the liquid in there. And just add it all. All right. Do you remember what this is? Mm -hmm. You want to smell it? Tell me what it is. What is that? Remember? Vanilla extract. Yeah, that's vanilla. Can you dump it in here? Yeah. Great job, Nora, thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna put my lid on there. Okay, so it's gonna get noisy. Hopefully it will tone down the volume here in just a minute. Okay, so that got it really well mixed. And if there's a few little chunks in there, it's not a big deal. We're gonna mix this all together and then we're gonna put it in this pan and we're gonna bake it. Without that. Well, we already got some cinnamon in there, okay? We ground, add some ground up. Okay, so go ahead and we're gonna pour this in and you're gonna start mixing it. 
Okay. And we're also going to add about one more cup of filtered water in there because we want the oats to get moist in throughout, but we don't want so much water that this oat bake's gonna be really mushy. We like it kind of nice and toasted on the top and cooked through. You should've got a ponytail holder on you. Would you like me to give you a quick little hand? Yeah. All right, that sounds good. Can you smell it? Smell like vanilla. Mm, yeah, I smell the vanilla. Do you smell the spice? Cinnamon? Yep. That was our key ingredient, wasn't it? So we're just gonna really do a good job mixing that. Is this one of your favorite breakfasts that we have? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I think that looks good, right? So just kind of like this, not too bad. Doesn't take very long. I'm gonna dump it into my can here. Now you could line this with parchment paper. I just did a very light spray of vegetable oil and just kind of wiped it. Um, like I said, you know, we like other people have said, we really don't want to use any kind of oil on our cooking, but a little spray is okay. It's just gonna keep it from sticking. So. All right, I never set a hands here. Okay. Mm, that smells good. makes a big batch. So one thing that I like about it is that this will last us for about two big breakfasts and usually we have seconds, don't we? Mm -hmm. And we just kind of push it down there. Yum, yum. Okay, last what we're gonna do is I'm gonna drizzle just a little bit of, what do you think this is? Smell it, do you know? I think I don't. Yes. I just want to. I think it's maple syrup. It is maple syrup. Okay, let me help you with this one, okay? Because we gotta just drizzle it all over, not in one spot, but just all over. Can you do it? Okay, just all over. All over here. All right, well, that's pretty darn good. All right, yay. Okay, so this is it. Now, the maple syrup is optional, you don't have to have it. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to bake this in the oven at 375 for about 27 minutes. And when it comes out, it's going to be nice and crisp on the top. You're going to see that the pecans are nice and toasted and the apples are cooked through. And I think, whose fork is this? That's Nora's. This is Nora's fork. Did you want to bite Nora? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Stop cooking the syrup. I guess she, she's loving the syrup. Okay. Take a bite. What do you think? I like it. You like I it? Love it? You love it? That's awesome. All right. Well, I love it too. So we're going to have this for breakfast tomorrow. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And if you are interested, I have Facebook and Instagram at Holistic Dish. And I am just always thrilled to come here and, and cook with my friends at So Many Cooks in the Kitchen. And I hope that you can join us next week on the So Many Kids in the Kitchen. I'm gonna pass it over to Dilip. We're gonna to go to live Q and A session now. Thank you. Great presentation, Cody, with the kids. Too no. many kids. <laughs> so um, we have uh, quite a few questions that came in, and uh, before we started, I wanted Mark to, uh, and and I probably should have done it at the top of the uh, at the top when I started, but. How could I have forgotten the Scoville scale? <laughs> oh, the Scoville scale, so yeah. Mark, tell, tell us again, what's the Scoville scale? So the Scoville scale, um, and it's actually posted in the comments. We'll post it again after I get done yapping here. But um, the Scoville uh, scale is the scale that rates peppers on the heat of peppers, right? So somebody asked about guajilla peppers, and um, guajilla peppers are medium. So to give you kind of a, a little... Um, a marker in terms of the Scoville scale. So think about uh, your poblanos, which are like, you know, what, a thousand something. The guajillos will go somewhere, I think it's like a thousand to four hundred, four thousand. Then you all heard about ghost peppers. You're talking in the millions, right? I mean, <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's, it's just an international um, way to really score the heat of peppers. So um, kind of cool. I just, I, I just love that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, um, 
you know, mo most of us, people like myself, I could probably go up into that uh, guajillo for much more than that, and it's hurting my tongue and other parts of my body. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, one thing that's really interesting about hot peppers is we all have different tolerances to hot pepper, but peppers have their own inherent flavor. And so I mentioned, and Mark just referred to ghost peppers. I, I dared not never ever try it because it would be way too hot for me. But uh, the seasonings that I have have ghost peppers as a flavor as one of the ingredients, but it has pineapple and other things to cut the heat. And I love it because uh, it's it's it dilutes the strength of the of the heat, but yet I can enjoy the flavor of it. So if there's a, a pepper you want to try, uh, and none of us really talk about making our own hot peppers uh, combinations or hot sauces, but you can do that. So by adding other things like fruits, dates, um, uh, uh, other kinds of fruits, you can, pineapple is a good choice, you can temper the, the flavor. And Shobha, you may want to talk about that as well, because of course in Indian cooking, one thing which, which disappoints me about um, the perception of Indian cooking, my parents are immigrants from India. And uh, so I grew up with uh, good Indian cooking. But when we'd go to Indian restaurants, we'd always be disappointed because the perception, at least in America, is that Indian cooking is very spicy and very hot. And it's not. The way you cook Indian food is you use a variety of spices, but it's subtle. You put a little bit uh, and, and then suit your palate. So when we go to Indian restaurants, we generally don't like North Indian restaurants because they're overly spiced. So Shoba, it looks like you might be having some problems with your audio, but did you want to throw in any additional information about heat in Indian cooking? Looks like Shoba can't unmute. So hopefully she'll, she'll be able to to share. A lot of cuisines temper the heat with things like, uh, you know, uh, fruit, fruit juices. Um, so yogurt came up in the chat discussion. And so I make my own yogurt from scratch. It's, it's vegan yogurt. It's from soy. It's easy to make uh, vegan yogurt. And uh, I can post the link. It's something like bit.ly slash vegan yogurt. I think that's my link and tells me, tells you how I make vegan yogurt. Um, so sticking with heat, uh, this came up, Angelita, for you. You were talking about uh, certain peppers, and people wanted to ask you to please repeat which peppers you used and how hot are they? So could you do that? Tell us more about the peppers you used and that you might yeah. recommend. Yeah, absolutely. I used the Wahio pepper, and I believe Mark just mentioned the Schofield on those. Um, those are very mild. Um, they're more for flavoring. They're very smoky. Sometimes they're a little bit sweet. Uh, now, the Chile de Arbol, which if you can't find that, that's found in the Latin market. The equivalent to that is called the bird's eye chili or the rat tails chili. And you can find that one at Asian markets. Those I believe are about 15,000 on the Scoville. So um, I only use four of those when I make a batch of the salsa that I made right now. So yeah, those are pretty potent, at least to me. I'm I'm very weak when it comes to eating spicy. So, um, and one thing I wanted to throw out there is I've been teaching um, cooking for many, many years and I always tell my students and sometimes they don't follow my advice is when you're touching a hot pepper, if you're using hot pepper, use gloves if you can. And if you can't use gloves, then try to maybe just hold the stem and be really careful of those white ridges inside because they can be awfully hot. And then when you're done, wash your hands carefully with soap, twice maybe, and avoid touching your eyes. And I had a student once who um, was making something. It was one of my Indian cooking classes. And um, in spite of my advice, she moved, removed her contacts and was not a good, good thing. So be careful with that. But you know, our, our show is about seasoning and spices and not just uh, hot spices like hot chili pepper. And I wanted to ask folks like Jeanin and and Karen and Mark, because you talked about, for example, uh, Berber seasoning or Gamasio, you talked about some very specific seasonings. Do you feel that these work uh, more broadly? Can you apply them to cuisines other than the ones they were intended for? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, Gomasio, do, do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, Gomasio is a Japanese um, seasoning, but I love using it on many other things. I spring the liberally on um, soups I make and salads. And of course, you know, just like you make, you can make a sushi and use it with that too, but, um, and they mainly use it on rice and things. Um, but I prefer to make it and use it on whatever I feel like using it on. A lot of times I make like a, 
a simple sauce using tahini and some uh, nutritional yeast and lime juice and stuff. And then I'll also sprinkle some of this in it and then put it on pasta. So yes, I think it's very possible to mix um, spices and seasonings from different cuisines into your regular way of eating. That's Karen, just do, you, do you have any thoughts, Karen, about that? Well, you always... I i uh, sorry. I agree. Um, like the only thing I did today that was halfway traditional was make my version of that dish, that Ethiopian dish. Um, and I, I, this is one of my favorite spices. So I do use it in it, everything, even a hummus, like a Middle Eastern hummus, you can put a, a berry spice in it. And, um, yeah. So uh, there were a lot of interesting questions. So Nancy, and I, and I didn't mention in the beginning, uh, a hearty w uh, welcome to Nancy. She's our newest cook in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, you, you, uh, it looks like you've been with us from the beginning. You're a pro at it. So we're so delighted you're part of our team. <laughs> so you sparked lots of great discussion. You were talking about resistant starches uh, and a, a number of questions came up. And I know you already answered at least one of them in chat, but I thought it'd be worth discussing here about somebody had asked about lentils. Can you take a few moments and tell us about what, remind us again, what are resistant starches and are there special things you need to do for dried lentils to make sure that you're handling the resistant starches? Well, resistant starches. So starch is um, it's part of the food. So starchy vegetables like potatoes, sweet potatoes, any of the root vegetables. And it's the, it's the root. So the starch is within the vegetable and that is what nourishes the plant as it grows is the, is the starch. Starch is basically a series of glucose molecules. And if it's resistant starch, there are lots of branches to the chains of glucose molecules in a way that the enzymes in our gut can't um, break them down because of the shape of all these branches, can't break it down um, to the glucose molecule, molecules to be absorbed. So those resistant starches go down to the gut, as I said. Now lentils, are apparently a very good source, well they are, a very good source of uh, resistant starches once they're cooked. All right, you don't want to eat raw, uncooked, fried lentils uh, because you just don't, it, you, you have to cook them. Um, once you've cooked them, the resistant starches are readily available. Now, with potatoes and the root vegetables, they do, once they're cooked and, and Root vegetables are the same as lentils. You don't eat them raw. You have to cook them. Once you cook them, they do have some resistant starch. But when potatoes have been cooled, it changes the structure of the starch and increases the amount of resistant starch. So if you, there are some foods like potatoes where if you cool them and then heat them up the next day, for example, they actually have more resistant starch in them. Lentils. My understanding is that the amount of uh, resistant starch is in there from, from the first time you cook them. Uh, so foods behave differently. Um, and now in terms of lentils, just to talk about that quickly, there are two types of lentils. There's red lentils, and then the other type is a group such as brown lentils, poi lentils, green lentils. Now red lentils are tiny, tiny little lentils. They're legumes, they're tiny, tiny little lentils. And when they are cooked, they break down into a, into a thickened, almost a mush. That doesn't make it sound like it tastes very good, but it is, into a, into a mush that helps to thicken stews and sauces. But once you've done that, you can't look at it and identify each little lentil, it's just, a, it's a mush. Green and brown poi lentils keep their shape. So when they're cooked, they keep their shape. So you can look at it and say, there's a lentil, same as you could say, there's a, a kernel of corn. Um, so they act differently within a meal. The resistant starch aspect is the same, but they act differently when they when you cook them. So uh, that's probably a long answer to a short question, but there you go. No, that's great. And this also reminds me that we um, we didn't take time to really in, at length introduce ourselves, but I did want to say that uh, we're all Food for Life instructors. We are selected from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, so we are PCRM instructors. And uh, I know, Nancy, I believe you're a, you're a MD, are you not? I am. I retired a few years ago uh, okay. with the OBGYN, and I just 
texted my son and told him that I'd rather be delivering a baby. It would be easier than trying to get onto Zoom today and less <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. But but I wanted to mention that um, and uh, that we, we all um, have credentials and we all know uh, a lot about both f uh, plant based food and nutrition. Um, and if you're interested in becoming an instructor because of the pandemic, we have uh, um, I don't think the next training has been scheduled yet, but I could be wrong about that. But keep an eye on ffllclasses.org to find out about other instructors. And if you're interested in becoming an instructor, uh, it's pretty competitive to become one. And this is one group that I, I always feel very comfortable referring people to. So if I, if I, if I weren't lucky enough to know Mark before and I I'd look him up, I knew somebody was in Chicago, uh, without hesitation, not knowing a thing about him, I'd say, Mark's your guy. He's going to do a great job with you. He'll tell you everything you need to know about plant-based eating. Now that I know Mark, I can, I can jump up and down and say, Mark is your guy. He's definitely the one you want to <laughs> talk to. Check, checks in the mail, Bill. Checks in the mail. <laughs> So um, I wanted to um, stick with the United Kingdom. So Denise, um, you spent a lot of time mm -hmm. talking about your curry paste um, and a lot of interesting questions came up about garlic. So um, I was actually surprised because one person said that they don't get good garlic in their marketplace. And so um, we do, we always get very, very good garlic. I occasionally get elephant garlic, which is really big and mild. I love it. Ooh. And so I, I was wondering if you take a few minutes to talk a little bit about selecting garlic, you know, maybe growing it if you've done that. And um, in terms of the sauce, so I teach a class in Thai cooking and I show my students, we have a mortar and pestle and we make, we make uh, our paste from scratch. But then I also tell my students, this is fun to do occasionally, but I actually buy it <laughs> because um, uh, it's the same brand you have. And I was going to show it in my segment. Uh, it's Thai curry, or I can't remember the name of the brand. But be careful when you're buying prepared curry paste because they sometimes have dead fish in them. And so uh, it, it often, if it isn't, if it, it'll say vegan and, and read the ingredients. But could you take a few minutes, please, uh, Denise, and talk a little bit about garlic and a little bit more about uh, the variety of pastes that uh, could be used in Thai cooking? <clears throat> Sure. And um, so just an um, interesting little factoid about garlic. Yes, I'm, I'm having a little bit of um, garlic anxiety these days because um, when I lived in the Netherlands, we could get the big, lovely, big plump garlic cloves as well. Um, and here, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're ordering so much of our food in because we're in such a lockdown and we're quite a long ways away. But the garlic tends to be a lot tinier here. Um, so um, actually, as I've been sort of developing recipes and things for folks, I've been doing a lot more of measuring, you know, minced garlic in terms of like a tablespoon or a teaspoon or whatever, because I think it could be really deceptive. Um, you run into somebody, oh, three cloves of garlic. And if you get those great big lovely ones, um, you don't know, you don't get so much from the tinier ones that we're getting here. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Maybe it's cyclical and they'll... It'll happen. I have not personally grown my own garlic. However, um, I live, um, seriously now, I live um, across the street from the beginning of a castle and that castle has a huge uh, garden. It's called the Wald Garden. It's very famous. People come from all over the world, volunteer and work there. And so they grow a lot of their, they grow all their own herbs and garlic's one of those. So I can actually get involved with that. So I'm pretty excited to learn how to grow things. Um, and I'll, I'll second your um, uh, kind of uh, caution about curry paste. Um, I think one of the reasons that um, I've really started to dive into making my own kinds of paste, my own mixes as well, spice mixes, even, even chili powder, um, is because I think once you start to make your own, you can you can really play with all of the the ingredients. You can make it exactly how you like it. Um, and when it came to curry paste, I in Thai curry paste, I really struggled with finding it. Not without I think it's um, is it fish sauce or whatever it is that's used or shrimp paste. I think sometimes I found as well, and then finding it with a whole lot of oil. And to be really honest with you, um, so my pers my paste is sitting right here and I can just smell it. I mean, that doesn't happen usually when I buy it. So when I figured out that I could make it very easily and make batches of it and get it into the freezer, um, it sort of just became another one of those things that I do. So um, one thing 
you know, I kind of practice and I've been doing for a long time is I just sort of have one of those kind of, I don't know what to say, it's kind of a spice day. So I check out everything that I have in the cupboard. Um, I think somebody I noticed on Facebook was talking about how long do spices stay, stay good. Um, so I always instruct folks that when you're making a spice blend, always look for the oldest date on anything that you're using. So the oldest thing is going to be the date of that particular spice blend. But spices can go into the freezer. So if you buy something um, that you know you're going to use just a tiny bit of, and it's going to sit there for six months, pop it into the freezer because those things then, you know, you can get a lot of life out of them. And especially for things that, you know, you don't use as often. I mean, certain things for us, uh, cumin seeds and black mustard seeds, we cook a lot of Indian food. So that it just, we go through bags of it. Oh, I, um, I, but, I, I yeah. totally agree with that, Denise. So yeah. um, my mom, unfortunately she passed away, but my mom, she would, um, um, she would buy uh, bulk Indian spices in the pounds yeah. and pounds, like 20 pound bags of cumin, exactly. right? And she'd freeze it. And uh, so, yeah. you know, it, it was unfortunate when she passed away. I mean, of course I do a lot of cooking, but I couldn't use like 30 pounds of cumin or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. And so, so what I did is I actually donated a lot, you know, I, I took mm -hmm. a bunch and then I, I donated um, a bunch yeah. to the nearby Hindu temple because I knew they'd, they'd use it. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 and, Mark here, you know, I, if I could just piggyback Denise, you know, in terms of the garlic, um, you know, we struggle in the, in the Midwest too with, okay. <laughs> with garlic, you know, and it's the farmer's market seasons around the corner here. So, you know, starting in May is when, you know, but then garlic really doesn't come uh, out of the ground here in the Midwest until later in the summer. Yeah. Garlic, garlic scapes, which are the, uh, the top whips Delicious. of the garlics, are just wonderful. And yeah. a friend of mine uh, has a farm up in Madison, Wisconsin, so we'll be grabbing those. But to the point where I made the sofrito, um, you know, I put 10, 10 big heads of garlic in there. Yeah. And <laughs> I tasted it and the garlic was pretty weak. You know, um, it was just, it's probably older garlic that got shipped across on a boat from somewhere. Um, yeah. Nancy, you'll, you'll appreciate this one. When my wife and I were in, um, in, in Ireland, we, we bought um, uh, rutabagas and uh, made some rutabagas in the house that we were, we were renting. And the rutabagas taste so buttery. I cannot get rutabagas that taste like that here in the States. You know, I think they end up being on on a ship and, you know, it's the soil. Mm. But my Lord, the, the rutabagas, I put absolutely nothing on them. So it's I guess it's where you where you live with the soil it's grown in, you know, how long it's been in transport, how long it's been in storage, the freshness, all, you know, all the above. Yeah, we don't uh, talk that much about um, in food for life classes. We want people to enjoy the benefits of whole food, plant based eating. And then if people ask, we can talk about organic. But we encourage people first go plant based and then we can talk to you about organic. And I do think organic makes a difference in taste and sustainability and what the farmers are putting on uh, their uh, crops. And, and, and I do think it changes the, the taste. You have a better flavor when you have organic uh, ingredients. I was going to ask a question of Carolyn, but before I do that, two really interesting points came through. So Marcia Beckward, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it, talked about Gilroy, which is the garlic capital of, if not the world, of the United States. I've never been. I, uh, I used to work for IBM for many years, and we had a big location. Our Santa Teresa lab was very close, so I never quite made it to the festival. But yeah, they do sell all sorts of garlic. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy Sabo asked about freezing spice and ice cube trays. Do you put them in water and then freeze? So uh, if you have a good Indian spice like cumin, ground or whole, you can just put it directly in your in your freezer. And I'll tell you a, a quick funny story for those of you who are a little bit older. Uh, when I was growing up during the space age, the space race, some of you may remember Tang. And I'm not claiming my mom was the most nutritious cook. She wasn't. So Tang would be where you, you mix this powder and get orange juice. I'm a citrus fiend. I don't even like like, you know, Tropicana or other prepared orange juice. I like to make my own or eat the oranges at Tangerines Fresh. But anyhow, my mom's my mom had a tang bottle, uh, you know, a food for the astronauts. And that's what she had some of her cumin stored in. And I still have that bottle. I was showing my daughter just last <laughs> week. I was saying, this is called tang. I don't know if they still sell it, but it's you know, freeze dried orange juice, I think. So yeah, you can just directly freeze the spices. Um, I wouldn't put them in water. There may be some, uh, for example, herbs may be useful, but you'll want to use them up pretty quickly. 
Uh, and then Gina, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Gina Kaur-Kalsa had mentioned about fresh garlic in the United States. So uh, just keep looking, find you know better markets, farmers markets. Yeah. Um, I, I have had good luck with fresh garlic. But I wanted to ask you, Carolyn, a question. You talked about uh, saffron, and I think you mentioned a few other uh, really interesting ingredients. I, I have saffron as well, and I use a tiny pinch of it. It's, isn't it like the most expensive food? So uh, I right. wanted to ask you what your experience is, and if somebody wants to make something, do they have to go off? Because a vial of saffron is like $12 or something. It's an amazing dollar cost per Per um, uh, per pound uh, or per ounce. So I wanted you to ask uh, ask you please, Carolyn, to talk about the cost of it and are there substitutes? Yes. So um, as far as the cost, yes, it is the most expensive spice there is. I mean, it's it's actually more expensive than gold, ounce for ounce. It is much more expensive. But luckily, you only use a tiny pinch. And so if you buy a container like this one from Costco, which I think was about $12, $11.99, something like that. Um, and they're, they're discontinuing it from what I can tell, but this is a whole ounce. So per ounce, depending on the quality of, this, of the saffron, it can range anywhere from, um, I wanna say it's like five, 50 to $500 a pound. So it is very expensive. Um, but it depends on the quality too and where it's from. So this one's from Spain. This one is a Persian saffron from Iran, which was a gift. And wow, was that a nice gift? Because um, it's that really beautiful, deep, deep red saffron. But yeah, I mean, it is very expensive. And the problem with it is if you're trying to mimic the saffron flavor, there's really nothing else that tastes like saffron that I have ever found. So um, you could try growing it yourself um, because crocus flowers grow, you know, easily in bulbs. You can buy crocus. So it's one specific type of flower, the crocus sativus, and they're purple flowers with red stigma that come up out of the middle. Absolutely beautiful. Um, you can actually grow them in the United States in more temperate climates that might have about the same latitude as Iran or Spain or you know somewhere in the Middle East. Um, so in the South, I could probably grow them here. Um, but I was going to point out too, everybody keeps talking about garlic. I have, I have um, 36 or 48, I can't remember, bulbs of garlic coming up right now in my garden that I hey planted hey several do. months ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I should take my camera out there and show you guys, I, you wouldn't even believe the garlic I have. And it's, um, it came from just two bulbs that I pulled all of the little cloves apart and buried them all a few inches apart that my mom gave me. And so thanks mom, if she's watching, cause I have a huge, <laughs> huge garlic garden right now, which, you know, I can eat the greens, the garlic scapes like Mark was talking about, but um, also pull them out, hang them in little bundles in my garage and just let them dry and cure as they call it because eating raw fresh garlic is a little pungent um, and it does need time to kind of let that flavor develop if you're gonna grow it yourself. It is actually really easy to grow it yourself and it doesn't even mind having a freeze. I don't know about um, you know the latitude of maybe Chicago or New York. I'm not sure you can grow it there, but I'm in Alabama. And so we can grow a lot of things here you know, unfortunately can't probably grow tulips, but you know, that they don't make it down here. But crocus, you know, you could grow your own crocus sativus and then harvest all the little stigma out of it yourself with a tweezers. Um, and the, <laughs> the crazy part is the reason they're so expensive is they really only bloom for one week a year, wow. like one week. And then they have to harvest each individual little stigma by hand. And each flower only has three stigma that come up out of it. And it's only early in the morning at a certain time in the morning before right. they fully bloom. I mean, right. it's like the process of labor intensive is so labor intensive that it totally explains why this is super expensive. I mean, you know, this one from Iran was probably $40. I mean, it's, like, it's five ounces, so it's quite full and, you know, really good high quality saffron. So and, and one yeah. hint about that, uh, and, and by the way, Cody and I last night, Lita and I were talking about harvesting or helping with the corn harvest, and she had to get up super early, like 4 a.m. or something, and, and mm. do that with the corn tassels. But uh, one hint about that is in terms of, um, uh, in terms of some of these ingredients, uh, uh, you can get them, saffron, for example, at Indian markets, I know, and they're, they're less expensive. So 
Uh, right. And uh, I always try to find organic. I haven't found organic at the Indian market, but I've but I've uh, found the flavor is is not it's not different. I don't think they spray them with many pesticides. I, would I mean, think those not. that because they're trying to harvest those tiny little stigma, they're not going to do anything to harm that flower. And it only since it only blooms one week a whole year, and it's um, very different from other crocus flowers. So other crocus flowers bloom in the spring. Crocus sativus blooms in the fall, and it's typically October. And depending on the climate, um, mid-October to early November, depending on what latitude you live at, but it's just one week and early in the morning and <laughs> it's, just, it's like huge labor intensive, uh, but wow, is it good. I mean, it's I, just so good. I wanted to encourage, we'll be wrapping up very soon. So I want to encourage if there's any last questions, please post. I, I wanted to, to start to summarize, to mention that one way to elevate your cooking from good to very good or very good to excellent is to start using these seasonings. So uh, I remember when I started cooking in, in college, uh, I would cook and if I were to go back and eat the food I made in college, I'd probably not be that pleased, um, <laughs> but it was much better than what could be available in the cafeteria, right? The school I went to, we didn't, Johns Hopkins, we didn't have a cafeteria after the first year. So we had to cook for ourselves. And so discovering and learning to use seasonings and not overusing them, but using subtle amounts can really separate you and encourage and can get your friends to say, hey, I want to go to that person's house more and more and eat at their home because their food is so good. Look at that cinnamon that Cody was putting into her breakfast dish or or look at all the peppers Angelita was using. So this is a great way to, um, to really elevate your cooking. To say nothing about the health, and I want to remind you that our recipe document, uh, our, our friend Brenda Davis, she's a great nutritionist, she has written an outstanding appendix as she always does, and it goes through in a lot of detail. Because there was a question that came up, one of um, the viewers discovered they were pregnant and we said, congratulations. <laughs> and they asked, do we need to be careful about any health uh, uh, effects of herbs? And I, I just want to throw out there that that anytime you make a dietary change, please talk to your healthcare provider about it. And Brenda has commented that most herbs and, and uh, foods have um, so many great health benefits, but certain ones, if you go too far with it, and it includes many of the ones we talked about, like way too far, it has some deleterious effects. Mm -hmm. So do look at what Brenda had to say, talk to your healthcare provider about any major changes you're making in your diet. Um, Cody, could you take a moment and tell us what we have in store next week? Not cooks in the kitchen, but kids in the kitchen. So who are the kids in the kitchen and what's going on next week uh, on Saturday? Yeah, so I'm really excited about this big event that we're going to do. Um, we're going to have Brenda Davis and Dr. Pinout Shah. Is that how you say it, Dylan? Resh Reshma Shah. Rush, Rush Masha. So they're going to come and be your guests and we're going to ask them some questions and they're going to talk more specifically about their wonderful book called Nourish. And we're going to open it up also to Q&A. So if you guys have any questions and want to join us then it's going to be fabulous. Our kids are also going to be joining us and asking some questions as well. And so we got my three little girls. I got Ava, Ella, and Nora. And you guys saw Ella and Nora today. And then Dillip has his daughter Anu, and you saw her earlier today as well. And then Ella Rodriguez in Rhode Island, she has a daughter and a son, me and Max, and they're also going to be joining us. So that's the So Many Kids in the Kitchen and we're hosting next week. We would just love for everybody to attend. Um, even if you don't have kids, there's so much to learn because um, they're going to talk about this book, like I said, Nourish, and it's just fascinating. It's any age that you can benefit from reading from this book. So I highly recommend it. And we all have kids in our family, uh, kids in our lives. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, they're both uh, awesome folks, and there's a lot to learn from them. It's, it's really nice to have uh, Reshma, who's an MD. So uh, I'm not trying to disparage uh, Nancy MDs. MDs are awesome, and I, I really respect MDs, but they just don't get that much training, and it's not their fault in nutrition. And so when you find somebody like Reshma or Nancy who do have that kind of training, it's, it's outstanding. In terms of us, Cooks in the Kitchen, our next show is April, and it's going to be Comfort Foods. So uh, I think I'm right. Am I right? I think it's Comfort Foods, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. <laughs> And so sometimes people might say, hey, I want to be vegan. I want to be whole food plant-based, but I'm used to certain comfort foods. And Mark has had some excellent examples. I think the last show he had uh, that played of, it was just it was just so beautiful, foods you're comfortable with. And so um, we're going to do comfort foods, but our comfort foods will be healthful comfort foods. Um, we have a show every month and guess what the month after that is? Uh, Carolyn, what's, what's May? What does that mark for us? Our one year anniversary, woo! 
<laughs> That's right. So we started this idea uh, a year ago, uh, a year this May. And uh, and so it turns out that there's a Saturday that will mark exactly one year. That'll be the last day of the year of one year of us being together. And I know we've we've attracted a nice community. We really so appreciate all of you who join us. And I have to say that uh, I feel like all of you guys, the cooks in the kitchen are family to me. I've met a few, but not all of you, right? So Mark, it seems like I've hung out with you in the past, uh, but never, never, never met you, unfortunately. <laughs> This virtual reality, it's like everybody. I can't wait to, you know, once we come out of the <laughs> pandemic to get to meet people in person. It'll be like old home week, right? Exactly. We're, we're, we're talking about maybe once we can start traveling, maybe have like a couple of us cooks together and do, a, you know, like two or three kitchens. And Cody and I have been talking about maybe having the kids in the kitchen all together and having a mm -hmm. location. So so that's coming up. And we can up. actually do the potluck we talk about all the time about <laughs> we can eat all our foods together afterward. <laughs> so much food left now. So yeah, so look for look for something special for our come to Italy for you all to visit in Italy. Unless you all come to Abu Dhabi to visit. Tell us, so Jeanan is moving. So tell us Jeanan. So you're our Ital uh, from Italy. Uh, and so where are you moving to? And uh, what do you think will happen with future shows? Because when we do our shows, it's like uh, 11, 12 at mm -hmm. night. Yeah, it's going to be late. So I'm hoping that Dilip and I are going to work out a way where I can send a recorded video of what my contribution is for that show. Um, next month, uh, in April, when I move there, I will still be jet lagged. So I assume I can make it to 11 o'clock to um, join the show. Uh, and speaking of comfort food, I'm going to be in quarantine. Uh, there's a very strict 10 day quarantine and I'll be in quarantine when I have to do the comfort show, uh, comfort food presentation. So I will have to come up with something really comforting to get me through <laughs> quarantine days. Oh my I'm goodness. I'm going to be all by myself in the hotel room. So <laughs> And uh, somebody, somebody made the comment about loving the virtual, and I did want to recommend, do look at fflclasses.org, and so we can take a negative and make it a positive, and so uh, a lot of us are now offering classes virtually, so if you're really excited about something that Carolyn said, and say, oh, I, I'm not in Alabama, and she'd be such an awesome teacher, or Cody, wow, it'd be great to hang out with her, but oh no, I'm not in Nebraska, or Denise, I'd love to be in Scotland, but I'm not, and so forth check out, see if they're offering any classes and uh, ones that you can sign up for virtually. Usually we don't do food for life classes virtually, but we are because of the right. pandemic. Uh, the classes mm -hmm. are very powerful. We use evidence to show you how you can, uh, by eating this way, whole food plant-based with limited fat, how you can stay healthy. And, uh, and it's amazing. Um, Karen, can you take a minute and talk about the power of plants for if we do get say diabetes or cancer or heart disease? Um, plants are uh, tons better than uh, medications without they have positive side effects like that ba um, balancing your weight um, all kinds of, instead of negative side effects from chemicals you put in your body you can actually prevent and reverse diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure um, basically the eating eating this way, healthy plant based, whole food plant based oil is kind of the same prescription for all of those conditions. Um, and you got to eat, right? You got to you might as well enjoy it. Learn how to how to make it easy and and delicious and support your health at the same time. There's so many benefits eating this way. We hope you'll stay healthy by eating this way. And if it, it's unbelievable, if if we have friends who have diabetes, it turns out a low fat plant based diet can address can mitigate diabetes can sometimes reverse it. It's almost too good to be true. And we ask you not to take our word for it, but check out the evidence and our classes provide it. And there's many, many sources out there. Somebody had talked about Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org. It's probably the best source out there to look at, you know, current uh, medical and, and nutritional research and what, uh, you know, all the amazing benefits out there. Uh, okay, do any of the cooks have any final thoughts? I don't see any more questions coming through. So, Carolyn, are you going to play your lovely theme song and the oh, way out? Yes. So, see you guys soon. Have a thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye. In the kitchen, plant-based meals to prepare. So many cooks in the kitchen with ideas for healthy to share.